$10,000? You were f***ing with me, right? Tony asked in shock. I'm dead serious. We'll split it three ways. We just need to stay in there for 12 hours, Dan explained. Man, I'd pay to stay in a haunted house. This is literally a dream come true, Tony said. Sounds good, but this is different. 10 years and no one has completed the challenge, Dan said. I'd remained silent during their discussion. Just like them, I loved anything abandoned, haunted or scary. But Dan was right. That place was different. It was just wrong. Hey, Ian, what do you say? Dan asked. I don't know. Come on, are you actually scared? He asked. I just think it's strange. The challenge has been out for 10 years and no one has managed to get through the night. Some even suffered mental breakdowns and allegedly suffered mental breakdowns, Dan clarified, cutting me off. 10,000 bucks, man, come on. Dan was a hard guy to say no to. And with the additional prize money, it was a challenge we seemed destined to take upon ourselves. The three of us, just barely out of high school, which literally meant that sum would literally change all our lives. At no point would the front doors be locked. We'd be free to leave at any point, forfeiting the challenge. To win, we'd have to stay inside from six in the evening to six in the morning. In theory, it sounded easy, but reality would prove to be far more complex once we set foot inside. You're the next ones? An elderly man asked as we waited in front of the main gate. He looked worn out, tired from the stress brought upon by years of an uneasy life. Yeah, we're here for the challenge, Dan said. You're just kids. Are you sure you're old enough? He asked. We're all 19. Well, Tony is still a week away. He's a slow one, Dan joked. I'm gonna need some ID, he said. A driver's license would suffice, and with a sign, he led us towards the front door. 12 hours, these are the rules, he said. We know, it's going to be fun, Dan said. No, it won't, he said as he unlocked the door. It creaked loudly as it opened, revealing little more than a main hall covered in dust and darkness. Feel free to leave any time, but you should know that it keeps getting worse the longer you stay inside. At some point, you won't be able to leave, no matter how much you wish to. What do you mean? Tony asked. That's all I'm allowed to say. You wouldn't like it if I said more. Yeah, yeah, let's go. I wanna get paid, Dan said. He nodded and led us inside. The clock struck six the second it locked in place, the sound echoing through the large halls. It had begun, 6 p.m. Seriously, this is the impossible challenge? Dan asked. Yeah, looks kind of lame to be honest, Tony chimed in. They were both right. Though the place looked eerie enough, it wasn't different from any other old house. Small windows letting the smallest amount of moonlight in and dust covered furniture from the last century. It was spooky, but that was about it. 9 p.m. We'd spent the past three hours exploring every dusty room of the house and we were woefully disappointed in the lack of eerie events. It seems like child's play getting the 10,000, yet something felt wrong about the place. Logically, there wasn't a single threat nearby, yet for each passing minute, I got an unexplainable feeling of impending doom. I didn't feel comfortable sharing it with Dan or Tony, but the look on their faces told me they could feel it too. 11 p.m. We decided to spend the remainder of the night in the main hall. All things considered, it was the cleanest and most well lit up place in the house. Only on the rare occasion that someone needed to take a leak, we would split up to visit the ancient bathroom. Dan and I were sitting silently together as Tony did his business. The house creaked weirdly as the wood reacted to the changing temperatures outside. We were considering whether or not we'd just sleep through the night and collect our winnings when we heard a loud gasp coming from the second floor. We rushed towards the sound without hesitation, running through a door none of us had even noticed up until that point. It led into a children's room with cheerfully painted blue walls with ducks on them, and in the middle stood an empty crib. Tony stood motionless in front of it, not even reacting to our presence. The entire room felt out of place, too modern compared to the rest of the house, but it wasn't exactly scary. Tony, are you all right? I asked carefully as I tapped his shoulder. It's not possible, he mumbled. What is it? This is Henrik's room, he responded meekly. Henrik had been Tony's infant brother, one that passed away from SIDS at six months of age. Tony had been the one to find his lifeless body in the crib, an event he'd only mentioned to his closest friends, one that had traumatized him. That can't be, how could they know? I was cut off by the faint sound of a baby crying. Is that? All of us stood frozen in shock 
as we realized the crying was coming from the crib. Dan started pulling the blankets away, desperately looking for a speaker or something planted there to scare us, but it was empty. As he knocked the crib over to check under it, the crying suddenly stopped, giving way to a twisted child's laugh. Then the door slammed shut, plunging us into total darkness. We quickly got our flashlights out, but as we scanned the room, we realized the innocent wallpaper had been replaced by cold stone walls, and the crib had turned to little more than broken wood. The room had vanished, replaced by an empty prison. We rushed outside, retreating to the main hall. For a moment, we contemplated leaving the house, but instead we remained, sitting in silence as we tried to process what had just happened. 12 p.m. So, are we gonna talk about what happened in that room? Dan finally said after an eternity of silence. Tony didn't respond. He just sat motionless in a corner, staring out into the room. It was a trick, right? I asked. Of course, but how did those f***ers know how to perfectly recreate that room? Who told them? Dan asked. It was a question none of us could answer, but Dan wouldn't let it go that easily. I'm going to check the room out, look for recording devices, speakers, and so on. I joined him, but Tony remained almost catatonic in his corner. I should have stayed with him, but a part of me believed it would help if we could confirm it was all just an illusion. Dan and I walked back up to the second floor, searching for the door that hid the nightmare, but it was gone. We inspected the wall from top to bottom, looking for any cracks in the facade, but the cracked paint and panes of wood showed no sign of hiding a door. By all means, it was as if the door never existed. As we returned to the main hall, Tony was missing too. Did he leave? Dan asked. Just like that, without saying anything? I asked back. Come on, you saw how messed up he was. So what do we do? I asked. Money or not, we should check up on him. Let's get out of here. Neither of us would admit it, but we were relieved to finally be leaving. If Tony had already left, we'd at the very least have a valid excuse. But as we pulled on the front door, it wouldn't budge an inch. We were trapped. Are you serious? Dan asked, annoyed. Let me try it, I said. As I pulled and pushed with all my force, Dan had vanished from sight. No matter how hard I tried, the door would not open. In a way, it felt as if the door was a part of the wall, a continuous part of thick wood fused together. By the time I'd finally given up, Dan returned with an ax. Where the hell did you get that? There's a small crawl space under the stairs. Stand back, he ordered. With that, he hit the door with the ax. Splinters of wood shot out in every direction, and after half a dozen hits, he'd gotten through. What the hell? Behind the door, we found little more than a solid brick wall. We're trapped? I asked. Without responding, Dan just moved over to one of the windows, pulled the curtains apart, and froze in place. Behind the curtains, we just found more bricks. In the few hours we'd spent inside, someone had boarded up every single door and window in the house. We spent the next hour desperately looking for a way out, yelling and banging in the hopes that someone would find us, but no rescue would come. Exhausted, we just collapsed in the main hall, contemplating our next move. We searched through every nook and cranny, and nothing had worked. A moment of rest would not come before the faint calls for help put us right back into a state of panic. Help me, a voice called. Was that Tony? Dan asked. I nodded. For a while, we couldn't figure out where the sound had come from. It was muted, distant. It almost sounded as if it was coming from below the floorboards, but during our entire stay, we hadn't yet found a basement at least not until Dan stumbled upon a door none of us had seen thus far. As we stood before it, ears pressed against the old wood, we clearly heard Tony's voice coming from the other side. Don't go inside, Dan said with undeniable fear in his voice. But it's Tony, I said. We don't have a choice. I opened the door, revealing pitch black darkness below. Tony, Tony. He called into the void. Help. He called out with a weaker voice than before. We turned our flashlight back on and rushed downstairs. At the bottom, a massive basement was revealed, causing all sounds to echo in every direction, making it impossible to find out where Tony was calling from. After a moment of hesitation, we spurted into the dark, calling his name. The basement was impossibly big, and before we could even search half of it, we were long since out of breath. But just before I felt my knees go weak, I heard Dan gasp in shock. What is it? I asked as I turned around. There he was. Tony hanging from the ceiling with his chest torn open. His body has been turned into a bloodless, hollow cavity drained from all signs of life. At first glance, I would have thought he was a doll, but his face had been permanently contorted into an expression of agony. He was dead. 
and he'd clearly been dead for quite some time, which begged the question, who'd been calling for help? Dan, I think, was all I managed to get out before I realized he had vanished from sight. Dan? With my old friend left missing, terror shot through my body. My mind became overwhelmed with a simple desire to escape. So I started running, not even knowing where I had come from. I stumbled through the dark, desperate to find the stairs I had come down, but it was a hopeless task. Then I heard footsteps surrounding me. At first, I assumed it was Dan, but upon calling his name, I got no response. That's when I realized just how many there were. Tiny footsteps coming from all directions, letting out ominous whispers. I kept running, going in circles until I finally saw a light. It was coming from the stairs. Just as I reached the threshold of the first step, I felt something hit me on my temple. Immediately, I could feel the blood pour down the side of my head, and the attacker was nowhere in sight. I swiftly climbed the stairs as my vision started to get blurry. My head felt numb from the hit, and as I'd gotten halfway up, the world around me went dark. As I finally awoke from my slumber, I found myself being carried away. Above me hung a perfect night sky with just a hint of orange on the horizon, making the beginning of a new day. Two paramedics were lifting me onto a stretcher, trying to talk to me, but I was too disoriented from the hit. According to witnesses, I'd stumbled out onto the street in a hazy state. They'd all assumed I was drunk until they saw the gash on my head. The police searched the haunted house, but could find no trace of Tony or Dan. They were just gone, as was the man who'd let us inside in the first place. To this day, no one knows what happened to Dan and Tony. And the few people I've told this story to all recommend that I seek out a therapist. But I know the truth. I just don't know how or why it all happened. As a reporter, I've experienced many things in this city that I can't explain, especially while going into the London underground. Whispers of ghosts, rumors of monsters, you name it. It could happen here in this forgotten city, under the city. Often it's difficult to even get down there. Police say that a majority of the old tube is not for public use, crumbling and decaying. Too dangerous, they say. And for someone like me, usually that's where my journey ends. But Randall Baker would just view that as the beginning. Randall is an urban explorer, someone who deliberately looks for the unbeaten paths and the forgotten streets that lead nowhere. The moment I interviewed him, I knew he was special. To him, these places were not just historical, they were personal. He had been to a dozen or more of them. So you're going to keep this all confidential, yeah? He asked me when I started the recording. Your voice can be altered and I can change your name in the papers, I told him. Truthfully, I didn't see anyone coming after him just because he went into the dark forgotten parts of our city. But Randall was convinced that some in London wanted to keep the secrets of the underground hidden. There have been several times that armed forces stopped us from going any further. Almost makes you feel that they are hiding something, yeah? What do you suppose that might be? I asked. Then Randall had a bloody brilliant idea. It really doesn't do any good to sit around here and gab about it all day. The viewers need to have a first-hand account of this shit, And you can't do that unless you go down there, he told me. I was hesitant. I knew anything that he was interested in exploring would be considered highly illegal. I could get in trouble for publishing anything related to it. But that fire of curiosity was hard to quench. The more he talked, the more interested in these secluded corners of London I became. So we agreed to meet that same night around 11 at one of the less guarded abandoned stations. According to Randall, from there, we could dive into the bones of the city and find something new together. Do you mean this will be a part of the underground that you have never explored before? I asked. That's what makes it exciting. There are places just under our feet that haven't had people in them for centuries. Think of what we can uncover, he told me. He arranged for four of his usual crew to join us, and all of them insisted on fake names, Mac and his wife Jules, and then two best friends, Thunder and Storm. All of them looked like how I imagined typical vagabonds, covered in tattoos and defiant toward the world, all eager to see what was beneath. You sure this reporter can handle the bunkers below? Mac asked, sizing me up. I was about to ask you the same, I told him. A larger man laughed and gathered up supplies, commenting, you should do just fine, boy. Randall instructed all of us to use the glow sticks as a source of illumination as we crawled under the steps of the abandoned platform to a sewer tunnel below. And from there, it was pitch black darkness. The air smelled of sewage and trash. Not exactly inviting for this sort of adventure, but I knew to expect it to get worse as we ventured down. Death and decay would soon follow. The entire group remained silent as we began to work down. 
using a rope to tether us to the surface and shimmy into the tunnel. It was a bit like cave diving, not knowing what you might see in the gloom. I knew there would be rats and roaches and other troglofauna. It was likely that most of these creatures never ventured up to the surface anymore for food. Before I knew it though, our feet hit the solid ground and we were standing in what looked like a massive old subway tube. Which way? Storm asked. Randall was checking his map. He had an old one from about the 1930s, back when these tunnels were actually still in use and he said, let's head north. All of us kept our conversations to a minimum as we walked and I did my best to keep a memory of every interesting barren feature of this place that I could. It was clear we weren't the first people to be down here. The graffiti was still pretty recent after all, but it still made me feel very isolated and very alone. Randall convinced the group to head down another vertical shaft to a lower mining facility and commented, this is where the good stuff happens, my boy. I didn't know what to make of the comment, but complied and followed. It seemed like this vertical tunnel went on forever and I actually wondered if they would even have enough rope. Randall stopped just a few moments after the thought crossed my mind and shouted, I've hit something solid, feels like a hatch. The others hurried down to use their glow sticks and let him inspect, sure enough, it was clearly an old bunker hatch with the date of October 1920 in it. What do you suppose is on the other side? Jules asked. Randall took out what seemed like a stick of dynamite, his eyes flashing mischievously. Only one way to find out, he said. All of us hurried up the rope to get away from the blast radius. I even wondered if the tunnel itself might collapse when the explosion came. Somehow though, we survived that craziness. It was nothing compared to what happened as we entered the bunker. As soon as we got in, it felt like I was in a time capsule. Everything inside was perfectly in its place, a definitive blast to the past. Whoa, never seen this before. Storm commented as he took his phone out and started to snap pictures. You mean this is a bunker you have never set foot in? I asked Randall. He didn't respond. He was too busy observing the architecture and the retro furniture, clearly taken aback by all that he saw. This doesn't look like Eastern European style. Jules commented. Everything in here looks so well-preserved, Thunder said. Then he pointed his camera toward a recliner that was sitting in front of a 1970s style television. To our shock and horror, there was something sitting there in the chair, a corpse that looked rather recent. Holy shit! Randall exclaimed, coming over to get a better look. How long do you think they've been down here? Jules whispered. Then, as Storm was trying to get a better angle for the mummified body, the corpse leapt up and grabbed his camera. All of us stumbled backward, trying to not trip over ourselves as we saw the strange half-dead person try to devour the smartphone. What the hell? How is this dude alive? Max shouted. It's a zombie, Randall said, moving back toward the way we had come in. We need to get out of here, he added. None of us bothered to object. We moved toward the tunnel that led upward, not even looking back as we heard the strange monster making low snarling noises and start to crawl toward us. Then it broke into a dash and tackled Mac to the ground. Get it off me, he screamed. For a moment, all of us were frozen in fear. Then Randall pulled out a gun and pointed it at the creature. Mac, keep your arms down, he shouted. The monster was opening its mouth wider than normal, multiple rows of teeth pushing their way toward our friend. Randall fired three shots, hitting the corpse back to the ground and grabbing Mac up with his right hand. Let's go, he said. We all raced up the tunnel, trying our best to escape the creature as we heard it make another loud bellowing call. Then the tunnel we were in started to rumble. The walls shimmered and moved, and we saw rows of dead eyes opening from slits in the wall. Dozens of other humanoid creatures started to crawl toward us, blocking our exit. This way, Randall said, moving left down a new crevice that led into a much more dilapidated tunnel. This one was clearly designed from the World War I era with old peeling posters of using the space as a bomb shelter. But some of the artwork was more recent and none of it in a language that we recognized. What the f is this? Jules asked. We heard the creatures starting to push their way into the shelter and Randall guided us to a ladder that seemed to lead to the surface. Climb, climb, he shouted as we all scrambled up. Storm lost his footing, not able to really grab onto one of the rails and fell head over heels back to the ground. I could just barely see his body hit the floor as the zombie scrambled toward him, grabbing hold of him like a fresh piece of meat. They ripped into his flesh and pulled his arms and legs apart, blood spewing onto the grimy concrete slowly even as other members of the undead group lapped it up. I couldn't watch the gruesome scene any further and kept climbing, reaching the top and having Jules pull me out before slamming the sewer lid down. Help me move this, Thunder said, pointing toward a large supply cabinet. Mac 
Randall and I pushed the heavy equipment on top of the drainage hole before finally collapsing on the floor and catching our breath. Holy hell, I did not sign up for that, I said as I wiped sweat from my brow. Thunder's hands were shaking. What was that down there? I've been in a lot of desolate places, but never anything that crazy, he whispered. Randall was about to speculate when the lights in the room suddenly flickered and I took a moment to notice our surroundings. We weren't back on the surface like we thought. This was some kind of laboratory, an observation station to watch over the undead society below. I thought as I saw multiple security cameras monitoring the feed of the abandoned tube. It started out as an experiment in longevity, a voice said nervously in the darkness. I didn't recognize it coming from Randall at first, but I suddenly realized that he was the one confessing. He was trying his best to sound brave as he explained it to us. London selected the homeless, the travelers, the children that no one wanted and placed them here, trying to make them better, to improve our society. He looked toward me with a face of anger, of hate, but they forgot about us. They abandoned the project the same way they closed off these tunnels and we were left to fend for ourselves. My parents had to sacrifice themselves to let me live. I had to eat them the way a dog sucks on a bone. And even though I knew that I wouldn't be around much longer, my mates were devolving, turning into God knows what, Randall stated. You let us down here to be their food, I realized. I'm preserving my society, he declared. And as I understood the reality of his dark plan, I felt a sick twist in my stomach knowing he was going to take us all down for what he believed was right. This was the story he wanted to share with the world, of the hate and anger that he carried from childhood, of what was waiting to burst into the world above. How long, I wonder, after we are gone, will this underground society stay down here? And when will they be hungry for what awaits them in the light? It's here. I don't know where, I don't know how, but it's here. It's inside the house. I've done f***ing everything. I've called Todd, I've called Howard, I even called a goddamn exorcist. None of them believed me. None of them so much as offered to help. Now it's Halloween and it's stronger than ever. I can feel it moving through the house, like a great darkness suffocating the light from everything. It's already taken my business partners, John and Erica. It's already taken so many others. I'm upstairs in my bedroom closet. I've been here for three hours now, and I'll be here for three more if that's what it takes. I don't know if the thing hates the sun, but it never bothered me during the day, only at night, always at night. There's a creak and a groan outside on the steps and I feel the house tremble as something monstrous moves through it. My breath hitches in my chest and I remind myself to be still, to be quiet. I just need to make it until sunrise, just a little longer. Then the voice follows, low, raspy and inhuman. So many lives, so many lives and so little time. It's singing a song but the tune is broken. Each word scrapes along my ears like a razor blade, cutting deep into my mind and pulling back memories. It sang before it took John. It was only a single word then. Coming. It had hummed, and we had all just thought we were hearing things. Now John's everywhere. There are pieces of him littered throughout the house, fingers and toes, and intestines and eyes. I weep silently into my hands, and I can smell John's blood on them. I can hear his screams. I can taste my cowardice for not doing more to help him, for not even trying. Oh, how good it'll feel to finally go. The thing sings. I wince in pain at every word. God damn it hurts to listen to it. Warmth flows from my ears, and I realize they're bleeding. Just one more, and then the song ends. I gasp in agony as more memories tear themselves from my mind. Erica. Her and I had separated in the panic of John's death. I had run up here, trying to call the police, but my phone was haywire. That's when I heard it come for her in the basement. The house creaked and groaned with the creature's every step. One more will do. It had sung, descending the basement stairs. One more makes two. I only heard her scream for a moment, and then it faded to silence, until the thing laughed, guttural and monstrous. It echoed throughout the house, shaking the foundations and rattling the old wooden frame. It laughed and it laughed. All that we need, all that we eat, 
All hail the coming of All Hallows Eve. Now it's moving toward me. It's getting closer. I can feel its every step, its every movement. It passes through the house with tremors of violence. Just one more. It sings again. And then the song ends. It's outside the bedroom now. And my ears are bleeding badly. I can't take it anymore. I can't take the sound. I clamp my eyes shut, trying to ignore the agony of its voice, trying to ignore the panic rioting in my body. The floorboards creak outside the closet, and I smell something rotten, vile, and grotesque. Something dead. There's a low groan as the closet door slides open. Looky, looky. It sings, discordant and tuneless. Wouldn't you like to see something spooky? I don't look. Agony tears through my eyes. They're being split open from the inside out, and blood is pouring from my head in a river down my jaw. I whimper, and something leans close to me. The smell of rot is nearly unbearable now, and I gag and retch, but I refuse to open my eyes. I can't. If I see it, then it's real. If I see it, then I die. Something grips my wrist, something cold and damp and loose with flesh. It pulls me from the closet, and I howl in terror and fear. It's taking me somewhere. Please, I sputter, please don't. My leg creaks as it drags me down the steps, and I scream. My eyes are clamped shut, but I feel myself moving through pieces of John as the creature pulls me through the house. Finally, it stops. I'm hyperventilating now, my chest rising and falling in rapid succession. No, 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 I mutter again and again. Yes, it says, and this time it isn't singing. It tosses me by my arm, and I feel my shoulder snap backwards out of its socket. I tumble down the old wooden stairs, my head smashing against the steps, my wrist snapping in half as I finally collide against the landing. I groan, tears and blood streaming down my face. Looky, looky, it sings though its voice is now guttural and horrible. It grabs me by the back of my hair, pulls my head up, and reaches its fingers down to my eyelids. Would you like to see something spooky? It pulls them open, and I see our studio. Our camera is pointing toward the cages, ten of them, each filled with pieces of the children, each a tapestry. The light in the basement is dim, but I can see Sally's witch hat, still tied to her head. I can see Michael's werewolf paw, still on his dismembered hand. I lick my lips. There, in the back is Yonda's Cinderella costume, the glass slipper still upon one of her feet. The thing throws me forward, and I crash against the steel bars of the cage. When I look up in a daze, I see Erica's corpse. My dear filmmaker, mutilated and cut into pieces, her eyes are missing, and her hand is stuffed halfway down her throat. I lean forward and vomit, only then realizing that I'm lying in a pool of her blood so many lies, so many lives, and so little time. Creature sings. I hear the click of a button being pressed and see a red light hovering in the darkness. The camera is recording. Looky, looky. Please, I rasp. The house creaks and groans as it steps forward and my body scrambles backward on its own accord. Please. Wouldn't you like to see something spooky? Also, it turns out that most of you guys who watch me aren't actually subscribed. So if you like the content and want to support the channel, go ahead and hit the bell. It's free, and you can always change your mind later. My blood chilled as I came downstairs for breakfast on a Saturday morning and heard the news. A reporter was following the story of an escaped convict, a convict by the name of Barry Marshall. But in the public mind, he was better known by his nickname, Big Red. His string of serial murders had come to be known as the Big Red Killings. The reason for the name was twofold. The term Big came from the fact that Barry Marshall was a very large man, but it also referred to the location of the murders, the Big Apple, New York City. The word Red referred to both his style of killing and his preferred victims. Every one of his victims had been found strung from their feet with slits in their throats. This allowed for the most amount of blood possible to spew out onto the ground below. He drained them like animals to be butchered. As for his preferred victims, he seemed to exclusively target women with red hair. I was more familiar with his motives, his actions, his desires than anyone else. Three years prior, 
I had been the detective who had finally caught him. It was my collected evidence that brought eight life sentences down on Barry Marshall for his eight murders. And there, in my living room, on an ordinary Saturday, some stranger was telling me that this man had escaped. My wife, who had been pouring pancake batter into a pan, turned to me with a confused expression. And behind the confusion was a shaking terror. I reached for my phone when it started ringing. I answered. Before I even said anything, the frantic voice of my boss said, Todd, I'm sorry you've heard already. I don't know what happened, but why the hell did I have to find out from a news station that the man I put away for eight lifetimes is now on the loose? I demanded, with a mix of rage and fear. Todd, I'm so sorry. We're trying to figure that out on our end. No one knows what's going on right now. We thought it was a false report at first, but, well, he really is gone. We're sending protection to your house right now. Just a precautionary measure, of course. But until we find him, you and your family should go somewhere safe. I wanted to yell, but I knew it wouldn't help anything. That's fine. Thanks, Hank. I said without emotion and hung up. I tossed my phone onto the lounge chair by the window and turned to my wife. The rest of the day went by in a blur. Two officers arrived and explained the situation. We would be temporarily moving to a hotel room since we still lived in the same house we had lived in when I had sent Big Red to the state penitentiary. He might have remembered where we lived. The two officers would then remain with us until Big Red was found and returned to his cell. The precaution and the fear all stemmed from the final words uttered by Barry Marshall as he was ushered out of the courtroom. He looked right at me and said, when I get out, they're gonna have to call me Big Blondie. And he laughed. Many were confused by this remark, but his statement was clear to me. It was a direct threat on my wife and daughter, who both had blonde hair. The implication being that he would depart from his ordinary list of victims just to seek revenge on me. It took everything I had to remain calm for my wife and daughter. Fortunately, my five-year-old was too young to understand the situation and be afraid. As we tossed and turned in our hotel bed that night, I realized that in the panic, I had forgotten my phone. I needed to feel some level of control and normalcy, so I got out of bed and headed for my car. I was stopped by one of our guards, and he told me that there was no chance he would let me go back to my home that night. However, he agreed to go and recover my phone for me. Reluctantly, I returned to bed. I fell into a restless sleep. The next morning, the officer informed me that he had not found my phone, but more importantly, there had been a break-in at my home. The window had been shattered, but nothing inside seemed to be disturbed. He warned me not to jump to any conclusions, but I already knew that it had to be Big Red. I rummaged through the bag I had brought to the hotel room. A sigh of relief escaped my lips when I found that I had at least brought my work phone. I unlocked it. The phone was connected to my personal phone, and I opened the Find My Phone app. A location popped up. I stared. I hadn't expected it to work, but there it was. I don't know why Big Red had stolen my phone, but now we could head straight for him. I called my boss. He answered, Hey Todd, good to hear from you. How did the relocation go? I hope that... Hank, I interrupted. I have him. I know where he is. You... What? Big Red. He broke into my home and stole my phone. I don't know why, but I am tracking his location right now for my work phone. I... Todd, we don't even know for sure that he's the one who broke into your house. You're not really going to pass this lead up, are you? I asked, my anger steadily rising. No, of course not. I'll head to the location right away. I just don't want you. I'm coming with you. No, Todd, absolutely not. I know him better than anyone, Hank, please. He's threatening my family. I have to do this. I won't do anything stupid, but I have to come. After a bit more back and forth, Hank finally agreed to let me come with him and a small team of officers who would search the location. They picked me up at the hotel and I assured my family that I would be safe as I said goodbye. We tracked the location of my phone to an old warehouse, but as we neared, the location suddenly disappeared. My personal phone had stopped transmitting its location. I began to sweat for fear that Big Red would get away. We reached the warehouse and the team of officers kicked the door in. I followed shortly after with Hank. The warehouse was completely empty, except for the horror in the middle of the room. Dangling from the ceiling was a woman. She was hanging from her feet. Her neck was slit. A massive puddle of blood pooled beneath her head. The red blood matched her red hair. A bit behind the puddle was a message crudely written in blood. The message said, still red, for now. But who's next, Todd? My heart was pounding. I wasn't sure if I was angry or terrified, but I knew what the message meant, and I had been right. 
The message was a promise that he would kill again, and this time, he might target my wife and daughter. Big Red had stolen my phone, and he was using it to toy with me. He had led me to his victim, but made sure that he would be gone by the time I arrived. Hank called in an investigation team to comb the warehouse and surrounding area for any evidence that might lead to Big Red. Go back to your family, Todd, Hank said. I'm sorry you had to see this. I don't want you anywhere near this case anymore. But the location, I blurted. We can track him. I can help you find him. I linked it to my phone, Hank said. I'll keep checking to see if a location pops up, but I doubt we'll catch him that way. We need to get ahead of him. He's too smart to give up his location on accident. If we follow it, we'll probably just barely miss him like we did this time. But I need to come with you. I need to catch him, Hank. I know, Hank said sternly. You need to go back to your family because your family needs you. Please, Todd, don't make this difficult. I turned back to the upside down woman in the middle of the large room. Dried blood completely covered her face. It curved around her lips and into her gaping mouth, which was frozen in a scream of terror. I couldn't help but imagine my wife's face, my daughter's face, frozen with that same expression, covered in that same blood. I nodded at Hank. Okay, I'll go back. Hank squeezed my shoulder. We'll get him, Todd, I promise. I forced a smile and headed back to a patrol car that returned me to the hotel that had become a prison to my family and I. Big Red's sadistic freedom was imprisoning us. We wouldn't be free until he wasn't. Back at the hotel, I embraced my wife and daughter tightly. My wife couldn't hold back anymore, and she began to sob. This frightened our daughter and caused her to sob as well. I continued to hold them until their tears stopped. Eventually, they found a bit of distraction by watching a game show on the hotel television. But I was checking my work phone, opening and closing the Find My iPhone app repeatedly. I eyed my bag. Inside was a gun. Not the gun I used at work. Hank had not let me keep that. In my bag was a personal weapon, and the second I saw a location appear on my work phone, I would go and do what I needed to do to protect my family. But things didn't go the way I had expected. In fact, things didn't go the way anyone had expected. That night, a location appeared on my phone. It revealed that my personal phone was just outside our hotel room. Big Red was there. I cursed myself for being so stupid. I had been tracking my personal phone, but Big Red had been tracking my work phone. He knew exactly where we were. I jumped from the bed and reached into my bag when a gunshot rang into the night. I opened the hotel room door. It was over. Both guards had their guns drawn. A small wisp of smoke rose from one of the barrels. In the middle of the hotel courtyard was Big Red. He was flat on his back, a hole in the center of his forehead. In his left hand, he held a knife. In his right hand, he clutched my phone. Blood poured out the back of his head and pooled around him like it had for all his victims. I stared. I should have felt relieved. It was all over. Barry Marshall was dead. But a dreadful array of confused thoughts flooded my mind. Why had he come here like this? He had basically given himself up. He was a smart man who had avoided capture for years. He had escaped a maximum security prison. He had rushed the hotel courtyard to hurt my family, but he must have known he would be shot down. He must have known that there was no hope of reaching us. His dead face bore a hideous, nightmarish smile. I suddenly understood. He was smiling because he had won. I wasn't free now that he was dead. I was imprisoned in my own shame and failure. He had brutally murdered a woman just to get back at me. My name had been written with her blood, and he had known where my family was hiding due to my own stupidity. He had been in complete control, and he wanted me to know that. He wanted me to know that there was no freedom for me, even though he was dead. I thought I could hear laughter emanating from the smiling corpse, and that laughter would follow me for the rest of my life. The last time we really celebrated Halloween was on the 31st of October, 2005. My wife and I had both grown up and found our place in a small, friendly neighborhood. It was full of families that loved the fun tradition of trick-or-treating. Each year, dozens of tiny monsters would pour out onto the street, looking for all sorts of candies to fill their bags. Linda and I were thrilled when our own son, Matt, finally grew old enough to partake himself. And at the ripe old age of five, we accompanied him on his first journey into the night, making sure he'd stay safe. He was a bit nervous at first, seeing all the masked children running about, some jumping out from bushes in futile attempts at scaring their friends. But he quickly came to enjoy the sight. We dressed him up as a tiny version of death with a minuscule scythe made from wood. 
He'd swing it around clumsily, more often than not, hitting himself in the head. Together, we made our way from house to house, watching as Matt's bag slowly filled up. Before we'd even made it halfway through, we knew there would be no way he'd finish a fraction of the candy without getting a tummy ache, meaning I'd have to find a way to sneakily claim some of his treasure for myself. A lesson in sharing, perhaps. As the clock struck nine, it was the high point for the kids. Most were running on a scheduled curfew that would take effect at 10, meaning there was precious little time to knock on as many doors as possible. I took note of a particularly good costume that looked like a demon, full on with wings and a tail swinging with each step. That temporary distraction was all it took. My wife had just turned to say goodbye to one of the neighbors, and as we reverted our attention to Matt, he was just gone. We didn't take it too seriously at first. We figured he was waiting around a corner, preparing to jump out and scare us. But as we called his name, he still didn't respond. Matt! Linda called out, getting more distressed by each second. I ran around the houses, checked in the bushes, scouted the crowds of costumed kids, but he was nowhere to be found. We started knocking on doors and asking bystanders if they'd seen him, at which point we quickly realized that the entire neighborhood had fallen into a state of panic. There were parents all over, running around and calling out the names of their children. Have you seen Dylan? One of them asked with a panic in their voice. 12 kids had gone missing in the span of a single minute, all disappearing without a trace. Those who remained were quickly escorted back inside as the parents ran around the neighborhood in a frantic but futile search. The police arrived swiftly, taking questions and joining in. But they too were quickly overwhelmed by the sheer scale of the event. Never had a kid gone missing more than a couple of hours, much less without a trail. But that night, a dozen children vanished off the face of the earth, and despite every effort made, they could not be found. The search went on for weeks, then months, and by the time a year had passed, the missing children were unofficially declared dead as means to give the families closure. But no answer could be given, and in the wake of Halloween 2005, our neighborhood fell into a deep depression. All public events were canceled, and Halloween itself became a day we could only try to ignore. Linda and I never stopped looking, but without anything to go on, we could only look to others who'd experienced similar events. But wherever we turned, we were given the same answer. You have to let it go. You have to move on. Still, we managed to stay together. Though I could see Matt's eyes in my wife's and she saw his smile in mine, our love was the only thing preventing us from drifting to madness. Each Halloween, we'd lock our doors, hide away from the world until the day passed. A tragic tradition that would occupy each of the next 10 years. And as time passed, we tried to get back on with our lives. Our son was nothing more than pictures and memories that haunted us. That was how it would be until Halloween of 2015. We were sitting in our living room, looking through old pictures when we heard a scream coming from the street. Thinking someone was in danger, we rushed outside. We found one of our neighbors tightly hugging a little girl dressed as a witch. It was an odd sight, considering our neighborhood didn't celebrate Halloween. One made even stranger by the fact that our neighbor was hugging a random girl. Julie, I can't believe it's you, the woman cried. The name rang a bell, and I quickly realized it was the name of her daughter that had vanished on Halloween 2005. She had been 10 on the day she vanished, and despite a decade having passed, she hadn't aged a day. She'd returned wearing the same clothes, though a bit worn out. Two more of the missing children were found shortly after, both wearing their costumes from 10 years ago, not having aged even a bit. Within the next hour, more children kept reappearing in the same spots they'd vanished from. Linda and I ran towards the last place we'd seen Matt, not willing to believe, but desperate to see our son again. Sure enough, there he was, still dressed as death, but missing his scythe. We called his name in tears as we ran towards him, but he didn't share the same enthusiasm. He stared at us with an empty, horrified look in his eyes, as if he couldn't trust what he was seeing. We kneeled down and hugged him tightly, expecting some sort of reciprocation, yet he didn't seem happy to see us. He just seemed afraid. Each of the returned children behaved the same, nervous, barely responsive, traumatized by an experience none of us could even begin to understand. They were all brought to the hospital for observation, where a massive team of specialists were brought in an attempt at understanding the situation, but none were successful. In the end, once they'd been declared physically healthy, they were taken to a psychiatric facility for rehabilitation. I'm not going to say it didn't help, 
but these kids were traumatized by something none of us could even begin to comprehend, and not one of them ever spoke up about it. They remained under the care of doctors for three months until they were rehabilitated enough to come home. Even then, none of them were themselves. We were advised to take care of them and not to pry into what happened until they were ready. Over the course of the next few months, Matt hardly ever left his room. He barely ate. He didn't play with his toys. He'd just sit by the window and stare onto the street or spend hours drawing things he'd never let us see. They looked like symbols, but he'd always hide them away in a secret chest. Only on a rare occasion, he'd whisper a sentence or two. They're coming, he said. Who's coming? I asked. The Watchers. Who are they? He'd freeze up as he heard that question, but I knew it had something to do with his disappearance. And the closer we got to Halloween of 2016, the more frantic his whispers would get. I don't wanna go back, he said, but he wasn't talking to us. Who are you talking to, Matt? They can hear us. Who? The Watchers, he repeated. Who are they? They needed us to make the door into our world. Now they are just waiting, he whispered. Waiting for what? I asked, my heart racing within my chest. The night when both worlds come together. He stopped talking after that, at which point I finally decided it was time to invade his privacy. Once Matt had gone to sleep that night, I dug through his locked chest of drawings. I expected depictions of his dark thoughts or an insight into the horrific memories he had. But instead, I only found hundreds upon hundreds of pages, each filled to the brim with text written in an unknown language. I took pictures and put the papers back, hoping he wouldn't notice. Then I sent them around to the other parents who'd also lost their kids during the vanishing. Most of them had no clue, hadn't even bothered to check what their kids were drawing. Only a few were worried enough to invade their privacy, but were too ashamed and scared to share the message. Though no one had been able to decipher the language, some had noticed a repeated pattern. We decided to hire professional help, and due to the mystery surrounding the disappearance, more than a few were willing to help, but they would need time. In the meantime, I did the best I could for Matt. He was still refusing to play, still drawing symbols we weren't allowed to see. I tried to ask a few times what he was creating, which would always cause him to freeze up and say one thing. The Watchers will come soon, then you will know. And as fate would have it, the translator would send us a message on the 31st of October, 2016, Halloween. All it said was, call me now. I picked up my phone without hesitation. Once he answered on the other end, he sounded distant and distorted as if the phone signal was dying out. John, are you there? He asked with fear in his voice. Yeah, what's going on? I managed to translate pieces of the text. It's talking about another world merging with our own. The children disappearing was just the beginning. They needed kids and their malleable souls to form a link between their world and our own. But the final connection will take time to be created. The signal was lost for a moment, at which point I only heard mumbled intermingling with static. Are you there? How much time do we have? I asked. I don't know exactly, but it won't be long. And if it- He was cut off again. John. You have to leave the children behind and get out of town. There's no other- The call disconnected. He was too late. I heard Matt say softly from behind, they're already here. That's the moment I realized just how dark it had gotten outside. It was only four in the afternoon last time I had checked, yet the skies outside were pitch black. What's going on, Matt? I asked in terror, but he too looked terrified. And without an answer, he just fled inside his room and locked the door. Despite my fear, I felt compelled to walk over to the window. As I got there, all the lights inside went out, including the street lights outside. The town's power grid had been cut. The screaming started shortly after that, blood curdling screams as people were being brutally murdered off in the distance. Linda joined me at the window, scared, speechless. Then a brief dark blue flash filled the neighborhood, followed by a strange black hole floating in the middle of the street. Moments later, a tall, lanky creature with obsidian black skin and a split face exited the void. It looked side to side, observing the neighborhood with unseen eyes before moving away from our house. Just down the street, there was a car that had run into a garden due to the shock of the sudden darkness and screaming. The creature walked in its direction with long steps, reaching out a hand towards the car door. The man inside tried to get out, but he was immediately snatched up by the creature. He let out a quick whimper before his bones audibly shattered from within. He was dead before he could even begin to fight back. Another three of the creatures emerged from the void, at which point Linda and I retreated back upstairs to bring Matt with us down into the basement. It was the safest place in our house, built by its previous owner during the Cold War, hidden 
behind a bookcase. We'd remain there for the rest of the unnatural night, disturbed by the many screams in the distance. It wasn't until daylight finally broke before we could see the true extent of the damage. The creatures had retreated back into the voids, leaving one third of the population dead, with their guts and flesh scattered on the streets. Of the dozen children that had been taken all those years ago, only Matt survived. According to witnesses, the creatures were specifically looking for them, but since our basement was hidden in a windowless bunker, they never found him. In the days following the carnage, we got another call from the translator. He explained that the horrors we'd experienced during the Halloween of 2016 were nothing more than the initial priming for things to come. He said they'd return each following year, always on Halloween, and that everyone within town during the priming were now bound to the place, unable to leave for more than a few days at a time without being killed. Each year they will return. Each year people will die. And it's only going to get worse from here. Hey everyone, if you enjoy these stories, be sure to check out the Dr. No Sleep podcast by clicking the Spotify link in the description below. There you will find more nightmarish horror stories not yet featured on my channel. For iPhone users, just search Dr. No Sleep in the search bar on Apple Podcasts. Now back to the story. For the first time in a decade, an inhabitant of Fairview had agreed to an interview. Just a day before Halloween, during the lesser known annual evacuation, my partner and I managed to grab one of the residents for a quick voluntary talk. Sir, you mind telling us what exactly is behind the annual migration? I asked as I held the microphone close to his face. If we got answers, we'd be the first journalists to ever report on the situation with actual believable intel. But rather than getting an answer, the man just froze. His eyes lit up in fear. I, I, I can't, he stuttered. They'll know. Who'll know? I asked, still insisting on an answer. The man stood silent before me, his eyes darting around us as if he was waiting for someone to strike him down. The Watchers. His 10-year-old son finally whispered, Matt, keep quiet, the man ordered. Who are the Watchers? Why do they force you to leave each Halloween? I asked. I just can't tell you. It would risk all of our lives. The only reason I agreed to this interview was to warn you. Stay the hell away from Fairview. If you see a cheap house for sale, if you get an incredible job offer, it doesn't matter. Stay away. Let the town die out. Don't enter its borders. If it's so terrible, how come you don't move away? I asked. You think I haven't tried? No one can leave. If we stay away for more than a few days, they'll get angry. We have until midnight on the 1st of November to return. Or what? I've already said too much. Come on, Matt, let's get out of here. There was something strange about his son that I couldn't quite put my finger on. He looked faded, emotionless. Though he was conscious and aware of his surroundings, his eyes just seemed empty. Alas, I wouldn't get the chance to ask any further questions because the man grabbed his son and fled in the direction away from town. Barriers had been put up on every road, strictly controlled by the local police force. Since the rest of the region was densely covered in forests, it made traversing the area by car an impossible feat without getting caught. It's not exactly the front page story we were hoping for, Alex said as he turned the sound equipment and camera off. I guess we have to visit the town itself, I said. If we get caught and spend a few nights in jail, it would still be worth it. How? Without a car, we're not getting there with any real equipment, Alex said. In this case, sacrificing quality for an actual story is worth it. So we drove back to the nearest motel where we'd set up a portable base. We grabbed the necessities and went to hike through the woods towards Fairview. It was a decently long trek, taking five hours on foot, but if we could get actual footage from Halloween within the town, we'd be hailed as heroes back at the office. We'd enter Fairview just past midnight, setting foot in town an hour into Halloween. We snuck deep into the woods, making sure we got past the security checkpoints before going back onto the road. Once we'd made absolutely sure not a single officer stood guard, we took our chances and followed the road straight into town. It was a dark night, cloud-filled skies that refused to rain, barely letting the moon shine through. In the absence of people, the road remained perfectly quiet. It was a silence only briefly interrupted by the odd branch swaying in the wind. It's a bit too quiet, don't you think? Alex asked. Really? Did you just say that? I joked back. Seriously though, I mean, where are all the animals and stuff? He had a point. In the absence of humans in such a densely forested area, I'd normally expect all kinds of animals, but there was nothing there. Shivers shot down my spine, both from the eerie atmosphere as well as the cold. 
but a minor spook wasn't going to scare us away. Just as midnight rolled around, we could see the town gates in the distance. It was a neatly decorated pair of pillars to signify our arrival, barely lit up in the moonlight. In their absence, the inhabitants of Fairview had cut the electricity. Whether it be to save money or for another more ominous reason, we didn't know. On the inside, it was a little more than a ghost town, abandoned to escape something we knew only as the Watchers. But the more we saw, the more we started to think the whole thing was an over-exaggerated case of mass hysteria. Hey, is that another person? Alex asked. On the corner, there was a tall woman dressed in a trench coat, facing the wall and drawing strange symbols on it. Excuse me, ma'am? I asked as I approached her. Alex seemed more hesitant, but followed suit. I pointed my flashlight in her direction, lighting up the text on the wall. It was red, still dripping down onto the ground, creating silent plops. Is that? Alex began. She ignored us, prompting me to go closer as concern arose within me. Are you all right? I asked. No response. That's when I first smelled the stench of rot emitting from the woman, combined with a metallic tinge hanging in the air. The crimson text on the wall still poured down the wall, the mystery language hiding its true meaning. Then I saw the tool of her writing. It was the remaining stump and bone of her finger, leaving broken flesh and blood at its tip. She had been writing on the wall with her own blood. Oh God, I let out. I think we should leave. This place doesn't feel right, Alex said nervously. I ignored him for a bit and tried to nudge the woman away from the wall to stop her from hurting herself. But no matter how hard I tried, she wouldn't budge. It was as if an unseen force was holding her in place, forcing her to hurt herself. All right, let's go, I mumbled, finally allowing fear to take over. This is too much. But before we left, I needed proof. I pulled out my phone to record the insane sight. Be it drugs or a mental illness or supernatural forces, it didn't matter. The world needed to see it. As I opened the camera application, I realized that I didn't have any signal. It either meant that a jammer had been set up or that the nearby cell tower also had no power. Come on, hurry! Before Alex could finish that statement, we heard a cry for help coming from inside one of the buildings. We rushed towards the sound, only to find it coming from within a boarded up residential home. Its only entrance was a door marked with a red cross. Help me. The voice of a woman called out, weirdly monotonous and tired. Alex went to work, pulling the planks away from the door, just barely managing to move them. All the while, the strange voice called for help. As we opened the door, we were met with total darkness. Even the minute amount of moonlight penetrating the clouds was halted by the boarded up windows. Hello? I asked. I'm here, said the voice, coming from the living room. Without hesitation, Alex rushed in, letting out a loud gasp as he saw the woman. I followed closely behind, halting dead in my steps. The woman's skin and muscle had sloughed off, fusing with the chair she sat in. Small tendrils of her meat had slithered along the floor, reaching out towards the body of what must have been a dead cat lying in the corner. Help me, the woman said emotionless, her eyes unblinking due to the lack of eyelids. At that moment, my journalistic skills completely failed. Without even thinking to gather evidence, the two of us rushed out from the house. But before we could even begin to process what we just witnessed, we saw a sight 10 times more horrifying. There, at the end of the street, wandered a 12 feet tall, lanky creature. It moved away with long, determined steps, seemingly searching the neighborhood. What the hell is that thing? Alex whispered. I remember the kid mentioning something called watchers, but whether he had meant the monstrosity standing before us or another horrific creature, I couldn't tell. Then a few of the doors in the neighborhood opened and people started walking out. There were about three of them, all walking mindlessly towards the watcher. In response, it turned, reached out a lanky arm and wrapped it around one of their waists. It squeezed at which point a central spike seemed to emerge from its palm, penetrating the victim. Only when it pulled away could we see the sharp tendril retreating back into its hand. Once the first victim was let go, they just retreated back into their house, their abdomens torn and their guts visible. I pulled Alex by his arm and signaled for him to start running. We chose the fastest route towards the town gates, only to be stopped as two more of the watchers walked by. They froze as they saw us, almost perplexed that we weren't transfixed like the others. Run! I called out, turning around and fleeing. Alex followed suit, only a few feet behind me as the creatures gave chase. With their long steps, they quickly gained ground. As we turned a corner, one of them reached out a hand, narrowly missing myself but getting Alex. No! He cried out, but it was too late. There was nothing I could do. I just kept running, escaping inside an unlocked house, praying they hadn't seen me. 
I thought I was in the clear, but the loss of Alex had rendered me unable to come up with any feasible escape plans. Instead, I chose to sit there and wait for daylight to finally break me free from the nightmare I'd willingly entered. But as the minutes turned to hours and not a single hint of daylight shone through the small cracks in the windows, I knew something was wrong. It wasn't until I heard the door open that I dared move. I grabbed a piece of wood I could wield as a weapon and prepared to fight, but it wasn't a monster that had entered the house. It was Alex. He had a severe abdominal wound, but it wasn't bleeding too severely, meaning he might have a chance at survival. Yet he ignored me completely, apparently in a trance like the other remaining inhabitants of Fairview. He casually walked over to the nearest empty wall. Once there, he pulled on his abdominal wound, covering his hands in blood, and started writing in the same strange language the woman had been writing in. Day will only come once all are one, he whispered, seeming to translate the text. I jumped at him, hoping to stop him from digging into his own wound, but preventing him from hurting himself was a futile task. I could only watch as he mutilated himself and kept writing. Day will only come once all are one, he repeated. I tried for hours to stop him from bleeding out, but for each attempt I made, he just hurt himself more until his body just collapsed, dead on the floor. Even then he didn't stop talking. Day will only come once all are one. Night still ruled the world outside, and I was starting to understand what he meant. Day wouldn't end until all had been taken by the Watchers, and until then, the night of Halloween would last, which led me to this moment. I've hoped for my phone to regain signal, or for someone to come to my rescue, but with the everlasting night, my phone's internal language has morphed into something similar to the writings on the walls. The only way to end this night is to join the rest of the inhabitants and get embraced by the Watchers. I only pray that once I do, the suffering of all the undead people in Fairview will finally end. I boarded the Titanic in Southampton with a dream of new adventures. My whole life had been an endless cascade of work, reading through paperwork, trying to turn nothing into something. Admittedly, I'd done quite well for myself, and despite coming from a rather poor background, I pulled myself through the hardship finally landing on stable feet. America was the goal, and what better way to enter than by the greatest ship ever built? The boarding was a mess of people trying to push their way forward. Even for the first class passengers, it was a futile task to maintain order. I held tightly onto my massive luggage, which contained everything important in my life. Had I lost it, my beginning in the States would have been a foregone conclusion. After a manic struggle, I finally got on board. The interior was absolutely stunning, beyond any craftsmanship ever displayed on a vessel of the same magnitude. Each wall, each painting, everything had been built and formed by the best of the best. I wandered the ship, checking out Café Parisien, the smoke room, and the promenade deck that made the world around us seem all too insignificant. Titanic was the center of the universe, and everything else became unimportant. Ahead of us lay America, only separated by the vast oceans between us. But first, we had to stop in Queenstown, Ireland. That night, I experienced what would be my first and last dinner at the banquet hall. It was the first class dining salon, filled to the brim with laughing people, each richer than the last. Though I'd provided well for myself, I felt so small compared to the famous people aboard. I suppose the lower class still lingered in me. In a way, I missed it. People just seemed more real, open about their emotions, not afraid to leave a bad impression. But here, everything felt forced. Everyone trying to look their best, even if they didn't feel it nor mean it. It dampened the mood a bit. I'd worked so hard for success, but now that I stood at its doorstep, it just didn't taste as sweet as I'd dreamed. Then the room around me changed. It was just for a blink of an eye, but what I saw horrified me beyond my wildest imagination. The entire dining salon was filled with murky, dark water, Tables, plates, and bodies floated in the waters, dozens of drowned passengers hanging lifeless in front of me. I couldn't breathe, I couldn't even move. I just sat there, under a million tons of water, feeling the pressure break my bones. Before I knew it, I was back in the dining salon. People were laughing, going about their days as if nothing had happened. I was in shock, mostly because I'd seen something that wasn't there, but also because it felt all too real. I excused myself, and decided to get away from the crowds. The ship housed an overabundance of different leisure time facilities. Among them was a Turkish bathhouse. 
I figured it would be the perfect bit of relaxation to bring me back to reality. There were a few people in there, all sitting around in silence, just enjoying whatever luxuries they could soak in during their trip. But the silence didn't bother me. I needed to shake the horrific image away from my memory. I lied down on one of the beds and closed my eyes. Minutes passed and I almost drifted off to sleep. That's when I felt the entire room tip over and I fell against the wall in front of me. One of the men screamed in agony as he broke his leg, but I couldn't make it over to him from my location. Instead, I just screamed for help, but my yells were drowned out by the loud sounds of flowing water. Sir, can you hear me? I heard a voice say as I woke from the nightmare I'd just experienced. Had I fallen asleep? Or had I just imagined the whole situation? The ship, it tipped over, I said out of breath. What are you talking about? I looked around the room. Everyone was fine, albeit a bit shook up from my frantic yells. We have a doctor on deck. Maybe you should get checked out, one of the stewards suggested. I shook my head, claiming I just needed to sleep. He let me get dressed, and then he led me into one of the hallways leading towards my room. Just get some rest, all right? As he spoke those words, the lights in the hallway started to flicker. I heard the sound of metal twisting as the outer hall gave into the pressure. What is that sound? I asked. Then, water came rushing down the hallway. I screamed again and fell to the ground from the sheer force of the impact. But just like before, it was over in a minute. All right, we're taking you to the dock, the steward said. At the med bay, the doctor on board just asked me generic questions about my previous experiences at sea. He thought I was insane. I could tell it by looking into his eyes. Not that I blamed him. I thought I'd gone mad myself. We're sending you to the hospital once we dock in Queenstown, the doctor ordered. But there's no point in arguing. You can either leave voluntarily or spend the rest of the trip in jail. That's how it came to be, that I was kicked off the Titanic. We had barely even started the journey, but mine had already ended. I was admitted for a short stay at the hospital on land, but the doctor quickly declared me healthy enough to return back to England. However, by the time I could return home, we'd all heard the news about Titanic. The unsinkable ship had hit an iceberg, killing more than half the people on board as it went down. Had I stayed, I probably would have been one of them. I don't understand what happened to me during my brief stay on the Titanic, but if not for the strange premonitions, I wouldn't have been here today. This will be my last transmission. If you're hearing this, please know that I did my best to save you all. I've run out of food and there's just no cure to this plague. When I die, my body will be located at Please burn the place to the ground and pour concrete atop of the remains. There's no solution. Please do not open the door. I'm so sorry for what we have created, but as long as I die inside this building, it means you all get to live. In the beginning of 2012, I joined a group called Sano Project, a bunch of scientists funded by an unknown prospector. Our goal was simple in concept only, to produce a vaccine that would immunize people via aerosol droplets. We'd been given a heap of different substances and pathogens to achieve the desired effect. We'd be using mice for the experiment, but due to the high risk of accidental contagion, we were put into lockdown for the duration of the experiment, which was only supposed to last six months. Food and supplies would be delivered using an isolated lift, taking everything we needed underground into an airlock. When we started, there were six of us, with Professor Jenkins in the lead. He was an old and equally odd fellow, but he was the top in his field. There was no one more suited for the job, and the five of us that worked under him greatly admired the man. Still, outside of work hours, he confined himself to his room with lab reports and an endless pile of books about exotic infectology. Honestly, as much as I enjoyed working under such a great mind, he scared me at times. He seemed overly enthusiastic about the experiment part and less so about saving lives. For the first five months, work went on as normal. We combined different pathogens and tried to create harmless fragments from their protein capsule, aerosolizing them as a vaccine, hoping the mice's bodies would absorb them. It was an endless stream of disappointment as the poor animals kept dying. Then. At the end of the six month contract, Professor Jenkins created something new entirely. While it wasn't anything near what we wished, he'd managed to invent something no one thought possible. He'd mixed a strain of highly infectious virus with a bacteria, 
It was a miracle with limitless harmful potential, and it terrified us. Still, his explanation somewhat lulled half the staff into a false sense of security. His idea was that the right mix of pathogens, he could invent a virus that integrated itself into the human genome, which then started producing a new type of defense mechanism entirely, something separate to the immune system. To us, it sounded like a ludicrous fever dream, but the higher-ups were convinced by his ramble, basically forcing us to stay under lockdown for another six months as we worked on Professor Jenkins' new personal pet project. We followed orders, making countless hybrid pathogens, all in the hopes that it might lead to a cure for all infections. I repeatedly voiced my concerns, but the rest were too afraid of reprisals to take my side. Then, halfway into the second term, the professor called me into his office. He looked unbelievably tired as if he'd been awake for days. I hadn't seen him much lately, as he'd always confined himself to his office while he did grunt work. I've finally done it, Carl, he said ecstatically. A vaccine? But we haven't even started the aerosolized trials yet? I asked, confused. He chuckled. We won't need trials, not for this. What are you talking about? I thought you would get it, Carl. Have you even looked around the world lately? We create cures for everything from basic infections to cancer and genetic mutations. We keep people alive decades past their supposed lifespan. And for what? To finally destroy the planet? To let our sheer numbers be the inevitable downfall of mankind? He went to the door, locking it before removing the key. I felt adrenaline surge through my body. And though I knew something horrible would come next, I hadn't the faintest clue what. I've created something that will save us all, but I need someone to start it all. Someone younger, healthier than myself. With that, he plunged a syringe into my neck before I could react. I pulled it out as fast as I could, but whatever its contents, it had been injected into my bloodstream. What the hell? I started to say before the world went black before me. As I was left unconscious, I couldn't tell whether I had died or if I was just sleeping. It all felt so quiet around me but also warm. It was an odd sensation, almost as if pressure was building up within me, getting ready to explode. Then, as if no time had passed at all, I awoke once more, lying on the cold floor of Professor Jenkins' floor. He was sitting behind his desk with labored breathing. Ah, you're finally awake. That means it has finally begun. He struggled to get out between breaths. I sat myself up and looked over at the professor. His skin looked oddly red, with flakes forming from ruptured blisters all over his body. What did you do? I gave you the cure. The only thing that can destroy humanity. My creation. It'll save this planet from us. His head started sinking as more blisters formed on his body. On his arm, chunks of flesh had rotted straight off. He was infected with something, the same thing he'd given me. Don't worry, Carl. You're the only one that can withstand this disease. That's why you're special. Because you'll be the one that is remembered as Patient Zero. He passed out on his desk, barely breathing. Then I heard knocks on the door as the rest of the crew were starting to get concerned. No, wait! I tried to yell, but it was too late. They'd already barged in. What the hell happened to the professor? One of them asked as they went to check on him. It was too late. They'd already breathed the same air as us, which meant they would be dead in a couple of hours at most. Only a minute after they touched him, the first crewman started coughing violently, then the second, third, and before the hour had passed, they were all dying. They called for help. No one came, because they didn't want to release the contagion. I was the only healthy one, which led the administration to believe that there might be a cure in my blood. They demanded blood samples be taken from me, but as the crew fell unconscious, I had to make a decision. If I let any sample escape this lab, the pathogen would be out there. So I did the only right thing. I disabled the only entrance into the lab, putting myself into eternal lockdown. What are you doing, Carl? One of the security guards said over the loudspeakers. We're sending in a hazmat team to save your sorry ass. Open the damn door. I can't. You'll get infected, he said. No, I won't. I'm not going to die from this, but everyone that gets near me will. 
If I open this door, I'll start the spread to the outside world. There's no other way. But then I heard him cough through the radio, which is when it hit me that the professor had opened up the vents, allowing the toxic air within to mix with theirs. What the hell is happening to me? The security guard said over the radio. He was dead, just like everyone else within the building. Listen, you need to seal down the building. No, I, I can't. If you don't do it now, everyone is going to die. He left the radio, and I could only pray that we weren't too late. Even the hazmat team was coughing their lungs out. They'd been infected before they even came down here. The only one immune was myself, because I was the ultimate carrier. I locked it down. I, I... The security guard said over the radio with his last breath. Everyone died shortly after that. With the building on permanent lockdown, I was alone. That was seven months ago. Since then, I've been working on finding a cure for myself, but I'm just not smart enough. Supplies have run out, and as I'm typing this, my vision has gone blurry with hunger and thirst. I'm going to die soon, but as long as the contagion remains within this building, it will have been worth it. It wasn't until I found myself standing on the deck of an unnamed military ship, sailing out into the middle of the ocean, before I finally started to question the mission I'd signed up for. The exceptionally large sum of money had been the initial hook, but the allure of a top secret mission was not something I longed for. Still, I had to ask, why had they chosen me? And where were we actually going? A good soldier keeps his mouth shut. I remembered my sergeant yelling at my face more than a decade earlier. Things had been so simple then. I followed orders and never questioned whether or not our actions were inherently good. In my eyes, I was doing the right thing, but the line between good and evil quickly blurred as I'd gotten deployed. I know they told you not to talk to the crew, but I gotta ask, what in God's name made you sign up for this mission? A man asked as I stared out at the ocean. He was well built, clearly a soldier based on his posture, though his outfit didn't match the rest of the crew. I fit the profile, was all I responded. Do you even know where we're heading? He asked. I shook my head. That's probably why they chose you. The name's Ulrich. I'm the leader of the mission, he said. I looked over at him. I wouldn't have taken him as the man in charge. He looked more like an enforcer, a man with more power than brains. His age fit though, and his cold, emotionless demeanor was enough to tell me he'd seen a thing or two. I'm Sean. I'm guessing you're going to tell me where exactly we're heading? I asked. Down there, he said as he pointed to the cold, blue ocean. I chuckled. I've never served aboard a submarine. If you think I can aid you in underwater warfare, You've chosen the wrong man, he smirked in return. That ain't it, Sean. We're going deeper, all the way to the bottom. I had to admit that the man had piqued my curiosity more than the initial briefing. Why? What's down there? Atlantis, what else? He exclaimed as if announcing a long-awaited reveal. The mythological sunken city? That's a real place? I asked, still awaiting the punchline. No, of course not. At least not in a historical sense. The Atlantis we're visiting is a base built shortly after the Second World War. In anticipation of nuclear war, a lot of rich bastards wanted a safe place to hide. They decided the bottom of the ocean would fit. It had to be kept a secret, of course. Only a handful of government employees ever learned about the project, and they've since taken the secret to their grave. The look on my face must have been enough, because I didn't have to ask another question before he started talking. The base remained a secret until a few documents resurfaced a couple of years ago. Apparently, we lost contact with the base in the 80s, alongside all the science put into the base. Can you imagine the kind of things they kept down there? No, I said. That's why we're going down there. We're going to get the station back up and running and retrieve as much information as possible. Two other men joined us, both clearly military. They were Jacob and Benjamin. The combat engineers meant to accompany us on the mission. As the ship finally stopped, Ulrich led us to the starboard side where a strange vessel had been prepared. It looked more like a lunar landing probe than a sub, one with an exceptionally thick hull. Ever been in the depths? Jacob asked as we were escorted inside. I shook my head, as did Benjamin. The truth was that the four of us were all strangers carrying only fragments of information. Due to the risk of leaking top secret information, I half worried we'd be executed upon completion. The vessel shook as they dropped us into the ocean, but as soon as we'd fell below the surface, an odd sense of peace washed over us. The descent itself was rapid, with light quickly giving way to infinite darkness as we sunk into the depths below. 
A few instances of small talk happened, but we quickly fell silent again with each creak of the outer hull, settling under the immense pressure of the ocean. I felt tense the entire ride, and it wasn't until I felt an abrupt stop before I realized we'd reached the bottom. I guess this is it, I said. All right, Jacob, initiate docking procedures. The rest of you gear up. I don't want anyone leaving this vessel without their atmospheric suit. You take point, Sean, Ulrich ordered. I nodded in agreement, and Jacob made contact with the docking station without much hassle. From there, we could connect to the station's monitoring systems. Looks like the pressure inside is fine. Life support is partially broken though. Only a few sections still have oxygen. We might be able to get them back up and running, but I can't promise anything, Jacob said. Any sign of life? Ulrich asked. Couldn't tell you based on this alone, but without oxygen, what could there possibly be? Jacob asked back. Still, stay alert. Let's get this over with, Ulrich said. My ears painfully popped as the doors opened. I raised my rifle and took the first step inside Atlantis. The station was running on its emergency backup systems, supposedly fueled by underground volcanic activity, but it meant we had little more than emergency lights to guide our way. The rest of them followed closely. As we exited the airlock, we found ourselves in a neatly decorated hallway that was more reminiscent of a 50s hotel than a submarine base. While the metal walls still stood exposed, they clearly put a great deal of effort into making the place feel like home. On each side of the hall were several metal doors, each marked with simple numbers and letters. Between each door hung a picture of one of the inhabitants, most of them scientists, some military. I don't see anything, Benjamin said. Neither do I, Ulrich agreed. The comm should be in section 7H alongside the control room, somewhere in the center of the base. We should deal with life support first. It should be right around the corner in 3C. The decoration made the station seem more gloomy rather than making it feel like a home. I supposed times had changed since then, but I couldn't help but feel like we were walking through a graveyard. This is the one, Benjamin said as we opened the door to the life support systems. Unlike the neatly decorated hallways, that room was little more than a generator room with machines and metal walls. It produced oxygen directly from water through electrolysis, essentially an infinite source of breathable air. There was also a map of the station on the wall, each showing habitability and biological activity. No signs of life at all. I guess we're safe now, Benjamin said. I lowered my guard ever so slightly while still staying alert. Shouldn't be too hard to fix this, Benjamin said. Almost looks like someone purposely sabotaged it, but they didn't do a very good job. All right, we'll go ahead and repair the comms. Are you fine on your own? Ulrich asked. Benjamin nodded. Then let's go, leaving one of our engineers behind. We kept moving towards the control room. So if the station went dark, but no one ever left, where are the bodies? I asked. Who knows if they got out, might have fled and stayed under the radar, Ulrich said. On the way, I took a peek inside a few of the already opened doors. They were bedrooms and offices, all neatly decorated to look like home, with personal effects and unmade beds. If the crew had left, they clearly didn't bother to take anything with them. By the time we reached the central hub, about 20 minutes had passed. The station was massive, large enough to house at least 500 people, all of whom had just vanished without a trace. Then we walked by a door marked differently than the others. C9, it read. A massive jump if the rooms were marked alphabetically. In addition, the room was labeled laboratory. Should we check it out? I asked. Later, we need to fix the comms and upload the data, Ulrich ordered. But as we tried to proceed through into the control room, we were met with a sealed door that had been fused shut. Someone really doesn't want to let us through here, Jacob said as he put down his bag of tools. But I can get through, just give me 10 minutes. I suppose we could check out the lab in the meantime. There might be some valuable information there, Jacob said. The two of us entered the lab. It was impressively large with rows of tables and hundreds of vials and equipment neither of us could recognize. There were a few typewriters and what looked like ancient computers probably only meant to decipher messages. The tables themselves were empty, except for one occupied by a lump hidden under a large plastic cover. Ulrich went to gather documents while I went to the occupied table. I had to take a few steps back in pure shock as I dragged the sheet away. What lay beneath it was a disfigured being I couldn't even begin to recognize. It was about the size of a human with pale, smooth skin. In place of its head, it only had a hole with numerous long teeth that resembled blades more than chewing components. The only other appendages were four thick legs that ended in spiky bones and multiple holes all across its body that resembled gills. But what truly worried me was the multiple gunshot wounds it had suffered. 
all of which only penetrated an inch deep due to its thick skin. The actual cause of death appeared to be a massive hole in its abdomen, but what had caused it, I didn't know. What the hell is this? I asked. Ulrich turned around, holding onto a bunch of papers. His face lit up with confusion as he saw the horrific creature, but he didn't seem all that surprised. Listen to this, he began. 19th of October, 1978. The runners have infiltrated sector A and B. We've managed to seal off the sections, but it's not going to hold for long. Ballistic projectiles have little effect, seeming only to briefly slow them down. The railgun has proven to eliminate the runners with moderate effect, but with only one still operational, we can't hold them all off. We've retrieved one of their bodies. Preliminary findings show that they're airless creatures. They filter oxygen directly through their multiple gills and have thick skin and unbreakable bones that he trailed off. It just goes on to describe their anatomy, but check this out. They only flee when the secutor appears. As far as we know, there's only one of them, but it is proven impervious to all weapons. Should it break through the lockdown, we need to evacuate the station. He finished reading and just stared at me. What the hell is the secutor? He asked. I don't know, but we, before I could finish that sentence, the sounds of fans broke the otherwise silent atmosphere. And with that, our radios lit up. Hey, it's Benjamin. I got life support working. Don't take off your masks. It's going to take a few minutes until the air is breathable. All right, meet us at the control room, Ulrich said. We covered the mangled creature back up and went to meet Jacob, who'd already managed to break through the containment. The control room was a circular area with tons of radio equipment and workstations. The floor was littered with small pieces of what looked like old wood. I bent down to pick one of them up, only to realize they were shattered human bones. Uh, guys, I think I found what remains of the crew, I said with a nervous voice. What the f***? Jacob chimed in. We'll be fine. The creatures have to be dead by now. Attach the transmitter to the comms, and let's upload all the data we can get. Jacob went to work with Ulrich as I guarded the room. I kept thinking back to the creature on the bed. Based on the log, it had already been there for decades. But if that was the case, why hadn't it decomposed? And where were the others? What was the secutor? I took a peek at some of the documents Ulrich had taken with, but a section stood out to me, one on the very last page. 30th of October, 1978. They've broken down our evac systems. The handful of survivors that still remain are trapped. We're trying to send out a distress signal, but the surface isn't responding. The only solution we found is to flood the station with carbon dioxide. It doesn't kill the creatures, but it seems to put them into an indefinite stasis. Our engineers are already en route to destroy the life support systems. The control room runs on a backup system, so we should be fine until help arrives. Based on the bones on the floor, it seemed like rescue never came. I listened to the fans humming and thought back to the fresh but ancient corpse. Just as I started to put the pieces of the puzzle together, another call came through the radio. There's something in here with me. I can hear them in the walls, Benjamin called out. What are you talking about? Ulrich asked back. As soon as the oxygen rose, I started hearing knocks inside the locked rooms and walls. I thought it was the pipes or something at first, but then they started growling. And wait, what the? Oh God, I see. A brief scream was heard before the radio cut out and Benjamin went dark. Sean, you're coming with me. We've got to help Benjamin, Ulrich ordered. But before we could even get going, we heard muffled growls coming from within the hall and some coming from down the hall. Whatever Benjamin had seen, it was coming towards us in mass. Then a few holes in the wall blew open without damaging the outer hall, and the first of the horrific creatures emerged. We'll hold them off. Jacob, get those comms working, now! Ulrich yelled. I'm on it. Ulrich and I took position in front of the broken up door and raised our rifles. A dozen creatures came running down the hall, with more emerging from the holes in the walls. Their gills pulsated as they inhaled the fresh oxygen that was being pumped into the station. Before we could even open fire, the hallway was full of monsters. Where the hell did they come from? Ulrich asked. They were sleeping. The air woke them up. We did this, I said. We unleashed a hail of bullets, most of which hit the creatures, but some went too far, forming holes in the wall. Luckily, the outer hull was far too thick to be penetrated. Our weapons were significantly more powerful than those used by the former inhabitants of the station, able to maim the creatures enough to render them harmless. There's too many of the fuckers, I yelled over the sound of gunfire. How much time do you need? Ulrich asked. It's already uploading. Let's get the fuck out of here, Jacob yelled. But escaping was easier said than done. And before long, we had been overrun by the creatures. Jacob joined in and emptied a magazine into the horde with little effect. One of them managed to get through and bounced off the wall to pound Ulrich. 
With a single bite, it ripped the flesh from Ulrich's arm. He let out an agonized yell as he fell to the ground. I walked straight up and put a bullet in what I assumed was its brain, which flung it to the ground. With that, every single creature froze in place. For a brief moment, the entire station had fallen into deafening silence. Then we heard it, a sickening, guttural growl coming from the distant hallways. It sounded almost human, but far too low-pitched, emitting a mixture between agonized pain and anger. Once the echo stopped, each and every one of the pale creatures retreated into the various holes and rooms of the station. What the f was that? Jacob asked. The Secutor, I take it. Ulrich groaned as he tried to stop the bleeding with a makeshift tourniquet. But let's not stick around to confirm it. We quickly moved back towards the airlock, planning to destroy the life support systems before leaving for good. As we turned the corner, we found long streaks of blood that presumably belonged to Benjamin, along with a few bullet holes in the walls. Where did they all go? I asked. The station had fallen eerily silent in the wake of the creatures. We stopped for a moment just to get our bearings, when the silence was broken by a sickly crack that vibrated through the air. Though the echo had made it hard to locate, it seemed to come from the direction of the airlock. We raised our rifles and proceeded with care. As we turned another corner, we found dozens of the creatures, all dead and torn to shreds. At the end of the hall stood a large, humanoid figure with its back turned to us. It was the Secutor. It had one of the creatures in its unnaturally long arms, which ended in little more than bony knives. Jacob tried to point his rifle in its direction, but I signaled for him to stop. Based on the notes we'd read, bullets wouldn't do a thing to it. But despite our silence, the creature somehow seemed to sense our presence. It turned around, still holding onto the pale creature. Its face held little more than two massive black eyes and a poorly formed opening for a mouth. Covering its entire body was clearly visible red veins. It let out another growl as it ripped the runner to shreds before it dropped the pieces of flesh and started rushing in our direction. Jacob raised his rifle for the second time and started firing while Ulrich and I retreated deeper into the station. Jacob, for fuck's sake, run! But he was frozen in shock, only able to keep his finger firmly pressed on the trigger until the magazine had emptied. By then, the creature had already reached him. It dug its hands into his torso with little effort and raised him into the air. Jacob let out a brief whimper, but it died before he even realized what was happening. Still, his death provided little more than a minute distraction for the creature, giving us almost no time to flee. We weren't going to be able to outrun the Secutor, and we both knew. As we passed one of the open rooms, Ulrich grabbed onto me with his remaining functioning arm. Get out of here, bomb the shit out of this place, he said before pushing me into the room. With that, he too opened fire, hardly hitting anything other than the wall, but he wasn't aiming to hit the creature. He just wanted to draw its attention. Run! was the last thing he said as he started retreating away from the airlock, luring the creature away from me. I'd been given a chance at escape, but it had come at the cost of Ulrich's life. I only allowed myself a second of hesitation before spurting to the airlock and our escape vessel. I sealed the hatch and tried my best to get the submarine moving with my limited knowledge. I took one final peek through the minuscule window, wondering if Ulrich had already been killed. Then I left Atlantis alone. The trip back was filled with a silence, only interrupted by the settling hull of the vessel. The mission had been completed, but so many questions still lingered, and I feared answers would be scant. At the surface, I gave my mission report and was paid handsomely as promised. Ulrich, Jacob, and Benjamin all died at the bottom of the ocean, all for a bit of intel that will still remain classified until the end of time. I recommended they drop a nuke down there, but a part of me fears that we were never sent down there to retrieve research but to confirm the existence of these horrific creatures. What they have planned for the future, I don't know. But I fear by delving down to the bottom of the ocean, we've awoken creatures that were never meant to be found. And if they are brought to the surface, that will be the end of life as we know it. School is in lockdown. Rumor has it that Alexis is on a rampage, and I know why. This thing, it has taken over Alexis's body. She has no control over herself. Alexis, she is not capable of this. She is the sweetest girl. I need to put an end to this before she hurts more people. It was the first day of my sophomore year in high school. Most of my class remained the same, for the exception of a few transfer students. While walking to my locker, one student in particular caught my attention. She was stunning. Beautiful blonde hair, blue eyes, basically everything I'd imagined in my dream girl. She looked a bit on the older side, so I thought she had to be a junior or senior. I tried to refocus on the task at hand. I grabbed my books and headed to my next class, which was photography. It was in one of those computer labs with computers next to each other. To my surprise, the beautiful girl was in the photography class with me. It was a small class with only 12 of us. 
I only knew one guy out of the whole class. Since the class was an elective, it also had juniors and seniors in it that I didn't recognize. The teacher had us all stand up in front of the class and do the usual icebreaker routine. One by one, the teacher asked us our names, where we were from, and one cool fact about us. I was the second to last to introduce myself. My name is Dylan Fries. I am from Michigan. I can play the piano. The last in line was the stunning girl. She introduced herself. My name is Alexis. I am originally from the United Kingdom and moved to North Carolina. My fun fact is that my family moved out of North Carolina because of a haunted house. Everyone in the class started laughing. Even the teacher couldn't contain himself. The teacher said, wow, that's the best one I've heard all day. The weird thing was Alexis looked dead serious. Before Alexis could interrupt him, the teacher started talking. Okay, class, take your seats. Since this is a small class, you can sit where you'd like. Alexis took her seat across the classroom. I followed in close pursuit. I had to know if she was just joking about the whole haunted house thing. And of course, I was really attracted to her. After taking our seats, the teacher instructed us to log into the computers and into our school email. He announced, click on your class, go to assignments, and click the top one. You will be given a list of photos and you need to make notes about what is wrong with each one. There is no right or wrong answer and this will not be graded. Feel free to work with a partner next to you. I finally had the chance to talk to Alexis. Hey, I'm Dylan. Well, yeah, dummy. You said your name to the whole class in the introduction. Well, if you're so good, what was my fun fact? Well, you can play the piano. How good you can play remains to be seen. Maybe I can show you sometime. That would be great, actually. A date it is, then. Changing topics, I wanted to ask you in all seriousness. Was your house really haunted? Yes, it was. We moved to, into this, like, really old house in North Carolina when we first got to the States. It just had that, you know, heavy feeling the moment you stepped in. At night, I would hear things move around and demonic voices. My parents heard them too. One night, I was asleep in my bed. Something jolted me awake. When my eyes opened, I saw this demon child hovering above me. It was the scariest thing I ever saw in my life. I blinked and it was gone. My parents had similar experiences. Finally, we couldn't take it anymore and sold the house. Now I'm here. Wow, that is quite the story. Before I could ask Alexis more stories, the teacher interrupted. Okay, class, save your work. We are going out into the courtyard to take some pictures. I assume most of you have phones with cameras. Those that don't group up with someone that does. We went outside the classroom into the courtyard. The teacher continued. Okay, now with your partner or group, each take five different photos of each other. Please change up the camera angles and poses. This is just a test run. The school will issue us the good cameras tomorrow. The class started socializing and taking photos. I took out my phone. Okay, Alexis, smile, I said. I held up the phone and snapped the photo. I glanced down at the photo. My heart fell through the floor. Right next to Alexis was a demonic looking child. It's long jet black hair covering most of its face. Is everything all right? Yeah, everything is totally fine. You know what? The sun washed out the whole photo. Let's take a new one. I quickly deleted the photo and held my phone up once again to take another photo. I snapped the next photo. I held my breath as I glanced back down at my phone. The demon child was there again, this time closer to Alexis, right up against her. This has to be some sick joke, I thought to myself. This can't be real. She must have messed with my phone. Is there something wrong? No, my phone is just glitching a bit. Let me reset it. I quickly deleted the photo and restarted my phone. Okay, let's try this again, I said. I picked up the phone again, hesitant to even take the picture. I pointed the phone at Alexis. Before snapping the photo, I glanced at the screen. Nothing was there. I took the photo. As soon as I took the photo, Alexis coughed. I ran over to her. Are you okay? I asked. She slowly looked up at me and I felt my bones shiver. It felt as if there was a demonic presence right in front of me. Get out. Leave me alone. All of a sudden, Alexis's head went limp to one side and raised again. 
okay. What just happened? I feel really lightheaded. I think you need to get some water and sit down, the teacher finally said. All right, students, time to get your things and move on to your next period. We went back inside the classroom. I gave Alexis my water bottle. She seemed completely fine now. The whole situation freaked me out. I arrived at my next class. I wanted to erase that bizarre situation out of my mind. What the hell happened back there? It hit me like a ton of bricks, the last photo. I never looked at the last photo. I pulled my phone out of my pocket. I went to my photos app. I tapped on the photo. It was even worse than before. The demon child looked like she was inside Alexis, like a spirit going inside of a body. Is this even real life? Before I could even think, an announcement was made over the PA system. Lockdown, lockdown, code black, code black. The teacher, Mr. Blackwell, immediately locked the classroom door. He told us to hide under our desks. Most of the students did not take it seriously. Some even had their smartphones out playing games. All of a sudden, a loud yell came from outside the door. Help, somebody help me. Mr. Blackwell peeked out the door. His face lost all color. He whispered under his breath. Oh my God, I couldn't help myself. I got up from under my desk and approached the door. Mr. Blackwell yelled, get back under the desk. What do you think you're doing? I ignored him and looked out the glass window of the door. In the hallway was Alexis. Her back was turned to me. She was holding onto a bloody kitchen knife. As if sensing my presence, she slowly turned around to face me. She barely looked like her former self and looked more like the devil child in the pictures. On the ground was the principal, Mr. White. Alexis had these crazed eyes and a devilish smile. I had this intense feeling that I needed to stop this. I unlocked the door and sprinted at Alexis. I tackled her. The knife flew out of her hands. The injured principal got up and ran away. Alexis, snap out of it, I yelled. I need to kill. Alexis, you are not a killer. You need to fight whatever is inside of you. For a brief second, Alexis seemed to relax and talk normal. Where am I? Oh my gosh. Why, why is there blood all over my hands? Alexis, you need to listen to me. There is an entity inside of you. You need to fight it with all your power and strength. What have I done? Get out of my body, whatever you are. All of a sudden, Alexis closed her eyes and passed out. The police came and I told them everything. I still had the last picture I took of her with the demon child, but they weren't interested. Alexis was admitted to a mental health facility, and that was the last I heard about it. The school brushed everything under the rug, and most students never knew what actually happened that day. There I lay frozen in bed, as I had a hundred times before. What had started out as a waking nightmare had become little more than a mild annoyance. Sleep paralysis, always occurring as I awoke from a bad dream. I darted my eyes around the dark room, trying to figure out what time it was, wondering if I should try to move my body or make a futile attempt to return to sleep. Then I felt the pressure build up within my chest, as if someone was crushing it with their own weight. I knew it to be little more than my imagination, so it didn't particularly scare me, but it felt uncomfortable nonetheless. But on that night in particular, the sleep paralysis simply wouldn't fade. I was trapped within my limp body, unable to even call out for help, as the words I produced merely formed whispers. Then I noticed something I hadn't seen before, a strange shadow standing in the corner of my room. I tried to figure out whether it came from a lamp casting a strange shadow, but if that were the case, why hadn't I seen it before? Then the shadow moved ever so slightly. What had been a projection on the wall was then a figure standing in my room. I felt adrenaline build up in my blood. Hallucinations weren't unheard of during episodes of sleep paralysis, but I'd never experienced them myself. I tried to wriggle my body around, but it wouldn't respond. The shadow took a step in my direction, and mild fear had turned to mind-shattering panic. I forced as much air out of my lungs, calling out for help. Next thing I know, the lights turn on and my parents come rushing in to check on me. Eric, what is going on? My mother screamed, my dad standing next to her with a baseball bat. I sat up in bed, finally freed, and observed the suddenly empty corner. Had it all been a dream? I, I, I just had a bad dream, I think. I thought I saw something standing in the corner. I said as I tried to catch my breath. My bed was soaked in what I could only pray was sweat, but in the grand scheme of what I'd just experienced, it didn't really matter. The nightmares are getting worse? My mom asked. I nodded. They were always the same, always the car crash with my grandparents. Their blood splattered upon my face as I cried. I had caused the accident, not on purpose, 
but I'd cried enough to distract them. At the age of four, I just didn't know any better. There they lay, bleeding out, but still trying to comfort me because I was scared. Those were the images haunting me in my dreams each and every night. Those were the nightmares that forced my body to stop functioning. My mom sighed. I think we need to schedule another appointment with Dr. Burke. I agreed. He'd been able to help me through the trauma, though only to a certain degree. With his help, I'd been able to get back in a car without having a mental breakdown. I'd known him for the better part of my life, and though I'd just turned 18, technically not within his scope of therapy, I wouldn't have accepted help from anyone else. Hello, Eric. It has been a while since we last saw each other. How's it going? He greeted me as I entered his office. At that moment, it seemed so childish. He was a psychiatrist both for children and teenagers, and though I technically fit within that realm, I wanted to be treated as an adult. Still, I sat down and talked to him, going over the nightmares as I had so many times before. Back as a kid, he'd mainly been treating my post-traumatic stress disorder with the idea that the nightmares would vanish alongside my anxiety. He wasn't a particularly big fan of medications for kids, so we'd been working under the theory of cognitive behavioral theory. Despite all that, the nightmares persisted. I know I've told you we'd stay away from medications for as long as possible, but now that you're an adult, it might be time to take the next step. I was skeptical, but in the end, I did trust the man. What kind of drugs? I asked. Just a mild antidepressant. If we can get your sleep under control, I'm hoping the sleep paralysis will vanish alongside the nightmares. I'll give them a shot, I guess, I said, still not convinced. The thing about SSRIs is that they might need some time to work. Typically, you'll notice an improvement within a couple of weeks, but until then, you need to keep taking them, as long as you're not experiencing any side effects, of course. He wrote me a prescription and sent me on my way. A mild glimmer of hope had been ignited within me, though it remained overshadowed by my lack of belief in medication. But I knew he was an educated man with years of experience. I'd diligently take my pills and pray for a good night's sleep. That night, I took my first pill and slipped into a deep sleep. Coincidentally, not only would the antidepressant help with my nightmares, but as a side effect, it would make me tired, which meant it kind of doubles a sleeping tablet. I felt myself fade into a dreamless darkness. It was a void where I was rid of any weight, floating in nothing except for infinite peace. I remained extraordinarily lucid throughout the experience, never once forgetting the fact that I was indeed sleeping. I just felt calm, content with my own existence. And so I would remain until my body finally landed back in bed and I opened my eyes. I was paralyzed, my mind frozen inside my useless body. Not that it bothered me too much though. Just having a peaceful moment of sleep was worth the paralysis. I looked around the room as usual, trying to figure out the time. Then I saw it again, the shadow standing in the corner, but it was closer than last time. I could even make out its basic humanoid silhouette Help! I let out with merely a whisper, but there was no one there to listen. My parents were fast asleep, and I was alone with the strange shadow that was moving just slightly closer than it had last time. Then I shot up in bed. The room suddenly cleared of all malicious entities. I could move, but that time at least I hadn't screamed. I peeked over at the time. It had just passed three in the morning, which meant I had a long night ahead of me. Despite the horrific experience with the creature, I was content that the nightmares had vanished and if the medication still needed time to function, I felt confident that the paralysis would be removed too. How did you sleep? My mom asked as I came down for breakfast. I slept, all right. Still had sleep paralysis, saw some weird things, but no nightmares. That's great, she exclaimed in joy. Why aren't you happy? It's just that thing. It was the same as last night, I said. A monster? She asked. I think so, I'm not sure. Eric, you know your mind can play tricks on you when you're tired. Hallucinations are normal with sleep paralysis. We went over it all together. I knew she was right, but it felt all too real. Still, I was almost excited to sleep. So when nightfall washed away the blinding rays of sunlight, I took my medication and headed back to bed. Once again, I slipped into the empty void. It was just me and my thoughts. All the horrors of the world didn't matter, as long as I could just stay in that blissful place. Just like last night, I was free from the nightmares. But once my body regained consciousness, I paralyzed back in my bed. I immediately glimpsed over at the corner, and sure enough, the creature was there, closer than ever before. The being that had once been a mere silhouette suddenly had more human features, though twisted, wrong. 
It was unnaturally tall, slim with twisted fingers containing far too many joints. It took a step closer, and I could hear its raspy voice and putrid breath fill the room. I put every ounce of willpower into moving a finger, then my arm. With a few excruciatingly challenging movements, I was finally able to sit up, and with that, the monster was gone. It's just a hallucination, I kept telling myself as I inspected the empty room. It's still better than the nightmares. So I diligently went on with the therapy, and each night, I'd slip into the same unconscious void, drifting further and further into the darkness. But no matter how far I sank, I would always awake paralyzed with the creature getting closer each night. Before long, I could feel its humid breath on my face and the sound of its creaking fingers stretch out as if trying to reach me. Its face was still shrouded in the darkness, only its hands were close enough for me to make out any specific details. The skin was charred with deep fissures that were actively bleeding, drops falling onto the floor below. His hand was just a few inches away from my face and its stench immediately assaulted my nostrils. With that, I shot up in bed and the creature had once again vanished. But despite being safe, my body remained in panic mode. I jumped out of bed and pulled open each and every door, curtains, cupboards. Then I checked under the bed and as I kneeled down, I felt something wet brush against my foot. It was blood, just a few drops of the putrid liquid that had poured out from the monster's hand. It was all real. I tried to tell my parents, begged to visit my grandparents for just a couple of days to escape the entity, but they refused. They saw the blood, but it didn't exactly look normal. It was too thick and lumpy, so they figured I'd just spilled something. Instead of helping, they just booked me another appointment with Dr. Burke. I knew I sounded insane, but it was real. So I decided to stay awake until I could come up with a plan. I didn't have any close enough friends I could sneak over to, but of course, that wasn't a permanent solution. While the first day went fine, I was still no closer to finding a plan. And as the 72nd hour rolled around, I drifted off to sleep, sitting on a chair in the kitchen with a cup of poorly made coffee in my hand. As always, I drifted through the dreamless void before being shoved back into physical existence. I was lying on the floor in the kitchen after having fallen off the chair. I was paralyzed and the being was standing closer than ever before. His face was finally visible, and it was little more than a solid block of meat with sharp teeth sticking out here and there. There were multiple small holes on its head, each containing a tiny tendril that wriggled around like a trapped worm. It whispered with a harsh, broken voice. That was last night, and though I fear for my life, I'm still dead tired. I can't stay awake much longer. Even if I do, I don't think it's enough to hold back the monster anymore. By this time tomorrow, I will be dead. And once I'm gone, the creature will just latch onto someone else. So if you wake up paralyzed, just keep your eyes closed. Pretend there's nothing there until it gets bored and leaves. It's your only chance. On the 10th of April, 1912, I first set foot on the magnificent vessel that had been named the Titanic. Just seeing its combined brilliance of engineering and architecture was enough to baffle my wildest imaginations. I traveled away from my home in Paris to get the chance to board her. I couldn't have been happier with the journey that lay ahead of me. It had been a long and busy trip to Cherbourg, so from the time I boarded, I took time to properly rest in my first class room. It wouldn't be until we arrived in Queenstown, Ireland, before I actually took a moment to admire the ship's interior. Once in Ireland, we picked up the last of the passengers and set sail for the open Atlantic Ocean. New York was our destination and it would take less than a week to get there. I started wandering around the ship, amazed by the attention to detail. Everything had been designed and constructed by the world's finest craftsmen. The entry hall staircase in particular gave me a true sensation of awe. It almost made me forget we were on a ship and not getting ready to attend a gala. Eventually, I found myself at a small lunch place called Cafe Parisien. No sooner had I set foot inside, before I felt my mind drift back to the open streets of Paris. Endless lines of cafes and restaurants, people chatting, and lovers finding each other. I immediately got myself a table and let the fresh ocean air flow across my face. I ordered myself a coffee and a croissant. I'd already eaten the little amount of food I'd brought from home and my stomach was rumbling. The rest of the trip, I'd have to rely on whatever food they served aboard the ship. As the waiters walked around, I could hear them exchange words with each other. Contrary to what the sign had promised, the staff wasn't French, but Italian. It was a minor detail that didn't really matter. 
and it wasn't as if French passengers were lacking. Still, I felt a strange sense of loneliness, traveling so far away with no one to accompany me on my journey. Then I saw her, that peculiar woman that would forever change my life. She was sitting alone by a corner table, wearing a plain white dress that starkly contrasted with the rest of the passengers. There wasn't anything seductive by her clothing, it just seemed out of place. I noticed her hand shaking, and she looked almost afraid. After a moment of thought, I considered she might need help. It looked like she was freezing, or maybe she was shaking because someone had attacked her. Regardless of the case, I decided to approach her, if only to offer a helping hand. Miss, are you all right? She just lifted her gaze in my direction, shocked that I'd even uttered a few words to her. I, I, I'm okay, mister, she stuttered. Did something happen? I asked. I don't, I don't think so. I'm just a bit confused. I don't remember. What's your name? Francesca Boucher, she said. I came with, she drifted off. Her mind was shattered. She struggled to get out any useful information. I looked at her with concern. I'm going to ask the staff for help. Stay here, all right? As I walked over to alert one of the waiters, I thought it odd how no one had seemed bothered by the clearly distressed lady in the cafe. Did people just not care? Or were they really that oblivious to their surroundings? I tapped the waiter on the arm and explained the situation. But as I turned to show him who I was talking about, all I could see was an empty table. The waiter didn't seem too concerned and didn't take my complaint all that seriously. Still, he promised to alert the crew in case they saw anything odd. Whatever might have happened, she had simply vanished, leaving me full of questions. I just hoped she was all right. The next few days went by in a haze. I enjoyed the sights, and the ship was full of activities any gentleman could enjoy partaking in. Yet, my mind still lingered on that woman. What had happened to her? Where had she gone? Once the evening of April 14th came, I retreated into the first class smoke room. It was surprisingly full. There were men gambling and smoking at pretty much every single table. I joined a couple of elderly gentlemen who enjoyed some cigars. They weren't too talkative, but didn't mind having a stranger at their table. We exchanged some cigars from our respective countries and my mind slowly began to relax. But as fate would have it, that didn't last because I saw the woman in the white dress again, sitting alone at a table in the middle of the room. That time, she was soaking wet and shivering uncontrollably. Still, no one seemed to notice her presence, which was odd, not only because of the condition she was in, but because the staff maintained a strict men-only policy in the smoke room. Surprised to see her again, I rushed to her side. Even if I couldn't help her then and there, at least I could figure out what was wrong. Hopefully, she wasn't in any immediate danger. Miss Boucher, what happened to you? I asked. She lifted her head slowly, barely able to move her lips. Her fingers and lips had turned blue, and she looked almost frozen in place. I remember now. I remember. I remember. Remember what? I asked. The ship. It's going to sink. I can hear them screaming. They're all drowning. It's too late. What are you talking about? We're fine. This ship is safe, I promise. Frost was starting to form in her hair as we talked. She looked like she was minutes away from death. I had to get her help. Just for a moment, I turned around to grab the attention of the staff. But once I redirected my gaze at the woman, she was gone. I was left alone, feeling like a madman. She couldn't have possibly been real, but her warning still lit up something within me. Even if the ship couldn't possibly sink, I felt it my duty to at least tell the lookout to pay extra attention. With that, I made my way towards the front deck of the ship, running through the long hallways. It was quickly approaching midnight, and people were scurrying off to bed, confused by my seemingly unnecessary rush. As I got to deck, I immediately found the lookout. It was a small cup-like structure pinned to a mast, only big enough for a couple of people. A crow's nest, we called it. Before I got the chance to talk to the crewman, I noticed an all too familiar figure standing by the railing. It was Francesca, wearing her light white dress. However, she seemed fine, dry, and happy, just enjoying a nighttime stroll. Miss Boucher, I asked, confused at the sight. She turned to me with a curious expression on her face. She didn't seem to recognize me. Yes, how can I help you? We met a few nights ago, you don't remember? I'm sorry, sir. I haven't seen you. She was interrupted by frantic screams coming from above. Iceberg, straight ahead! A crewman yelled in panic as he started ringing the alarm. The ship started to rapidly slow down, but it wasn't enough. 
Within seconds, the side of the ship collided with an enormous iceberg. It shook us enough to push me to the ground. As I fell, I saw Francesca slip and fall over the railing. She let out a short yelp as she fell into the dark waters below, vanishing before I could even get to my feet. I tried to warn the crew, but there was nothing we could do. She was just gone. The rest of the story isn't a very pleasant one. The iceberg caused severe hull destruction, causing the Titanic to flood. Before long, we were ready to abandon ship, and I was among the first to be rushed to a rescue boat. Despite women and children being priority, the simple fact that I was already on deck made them push me onto one of the boats. I survived the sinking of the Titanic, not because I was quick to act, but because a dead woman tried to warn me. Francesca Boucher saved my life, and I'll never know how, nor will I be able to thank her. It was the summer of 2018. I had recently graduated college with two of my good friends, John and Haley. John had been a close friend my whole life, and I met Haley in one of my college classes. I had a crush on Haley since I met her. She was a beautiful girl, blonde hair, blue eyes, and a small, petite figure. I always wondered what a girl like her was doing single. Haley suggested that John and I join her for a few days in New York City. She said it would be a great way to blow off some steam before we got started with our real jobs. John and I found really cheap airline tickets and a reasonably priced Airbnb in Midtown New York City, and we decided to go. We planned on staying for three nights, but little did I know, we would be back after just one night. We had just arrived to our Airbnb from the airport. The sun was just beginning to set on the New York City skyline. The view was incredible from the high-rise condo we were staying in. I wasn't used to big cities, so everything seemed a bit overwhelming. Since we arrived at our Airbnb, Haley had been on her phone most of the time. I asked her what she was doing, and she told me it was none of my business. I glanced over her shoulder, and before she could shield her phone, I saw the Tinder logo. I said, come on, Haley, really? A girl like you shouldn't be on Tinder. She said, I'm just messing around and it's harmless anyways. I told her, you have to be careful. There's a lot of creeps on there. Who knew that those words would foreshadow what was to come? After dinner, Haley suggested we all go out. She said she knew of an upscale two-story club downtown. I said, how do you even know of a club when this is your first time in New York City? Haley said, I saw some good reviews online. I said, sure. I bet your newfound Tinder boyfriend said to go to this club. Haley laughed and said, okay, maybe you're right, but I think we should still go. He seemed like a cool guy and if he isn't, we can just leave. I knew Haley was going to have her way regardless, so I didn't even try and argue with her. I said, okay, fine, we will go to this club, but if he is sketchy, we are leaving right away. The club was about a mile away, so we decided to walk. As we got closer to the nightclub, we started to hear the bass. We rounded a corner and saw a line of about 20 people waiting to get into the club. The exterior of the nightclub was all brick and had green vines running down the side. I glanced at the club's windows and saw bright neon flashing lights. I could also make out the dancing silhouettes of partygoers. Even though there were only about 20 people in line, it seemed like they weren't letting anyone in. Every couple minutes, someone would walk up, skip the line and go right in. I thought they must be well connected to completely skip the line to a premier nightclub. Maybe politicians or rich business owners, I thought to myself. As I was in line, something caught my eye through one of the second floor windows. I saw someone's head pressed up against the glass. The windows were tinted, so I couldn't make out any details, but it seemed like the person was looking in my direction. I thought maybe the person was looking for a friend who was stuck in line. I glanced away and looked back at the window and the person was gone. After waiting for what seemed like forever, we finally made it inside the club. The area was crowded, but not as packed as I thought. There were two bars on the right and left side of the club on the first floor. On the far end of the club, there were two spiral staircases leading to the second floor. The second floor wrapped around the entire nightclub and overlooked the dance floor. Haley suggested that we get some drinks before it gets too crowded. John and I agreed and followed her to the bar. As we were walking to the bar, I made eye contact with a guy on the second floor. He was leaning against the railing facing my direction. He seemed very scrawny and pale. He had a bowl cut and his hair was parted down the middle of his forehead. I kept holding eye contact with him. As we held stares, he slowly started to smile at me. His smile got bigger and bigger. His smile got so big, I could make out every tooth in his mouth. As he smiled at me, he pointed at himself and then he pointed towards the bar. I looked over to where he was pointing 
and I realized it was exactly where Haley was standing. I looked back at him, but he was gone. Chills ran down my spine. Adrenaline began to flow through me like a fire hose. His appearance and creepy smile reminded me of a horror movie villain. I got a really bad vibe from this guy and wanted to leave immediately. I pulled John aside and told him what had just happened. John said not to worry about it and that the guy was probably just trying to mess with me. I told John this time it's different and that I know when someone is just messing around. I told John not to tell Haley about what had just happened. I didn't want her to freak out. I went up to Haley and said, maybe we should check out another bar or club. She said, no way. We just waited in line for 30 minutes. Let's at least get a couple of drinks and chill out for a bit. I thought to myself, maybe the creepy guy I saw was the same guy Haley was talking to on Tinder. I asked Haley if her Tinder guy was here. Haley said, the guy told me he was here, but he hasn't been responding to my messages. I asked Haley if I could take a look at his Tinder profile. She laughed <laughs> and asked me if I was jealous. I said, just let me see his page. Haley was reluctant at first, but she finally agreed and handed me her phone. She noticed the stressed out look on my face. She laughed and said, man, this Tinder guy has you really stressed out, huh? I ignored her. After taking a look at Haley's Tinder guy, I realized he wasn't the creepy guy I saw earlier. The Tinder guy was a buff New York City firefighter. I handed the phone back to Haley and she got in line to order a drink. Now I didn't know what to think. Was this all just a misunderstanding? Was this creepy guy just looking at someone else and not me? Maybe one of his friends? After thinking about the situation, I knew he had to have been looking at me. But how did this creep know Haley, or me for that matter? As I looked around, I noticed the club was significantly more crowded. It was getting harder to move around. My mind went to Haley again. I glanced around and I didn't see Haley anywhere. I started to get really anxious. Right before I started to panic, I saw the back of Haley's head some distance away at the front of the bar. I sighed in relief. Finally, Haley made it back to us with a few drinks in her hands. As she was walking up to us, I knew something wasn't right. Haley had a pale look to her face, like she saw a ghost or something. I asked her, what's up? What happened to you? She started breaking down crying. I grabbed her and pulled her into my arms. I said, everything's going to be okay. Tell me exactly what happened. She said, I heard some guy say my name in a really creepy voice. He said, Haley. It sounded so close, as if he was standing just a foot away from me. There were so many people around me, I couldn't figure out who it was. At first, I thought it was just you messing with me, but then I saw you standing way over here. I knew it couldn't be you. All of a sudden, Haley's phone started lighting up with Tinder notifications. She began reading them and said, oh my God. I said, what's wrong? She said, read this. The Tinder firefighter guy said his account had been hacked and that all the messages that had been sent to Haley were not from him. We all agreed we needed to leave as fast as possible. We bolted from the nightclub and quickly waved down a taxi. We headed immediately back to our Airbnb. A huge sense of relief filled my body. My heart rate started to slow down and I started to feel normal. I was so glad to be out of that place. We arrived at the main lobby of our Airbnb. I pressed the button for the elevator and we all got in. I saw a Snapchat notification pop up on Haley's phone. Haley looked down at her phone and I saw the same ghostly look come across her face again. I thought to myself, oh no, what now? She said, oh my God, I totally forgot I added the Tinder guy on Snapchat before we went out. I asked Haley if she had her location on. She said, yes I do, why? I said, that creep knows where we were staying and knows we are right. Before I could even finish my sentence, the elevator doors opened and my heart dropped. Right in front of us was the same creepy guy at the nightclub. He was staring right at us. That same fanatical smile across his pale face. He said, why did you guys leave in such a hurry? We were just starting to have fun. I swear to God, if I miss this flight home, my boss will have my head. The damn traffic and a painfully slow Uber driver have left me entering the airport with only 20 minutes until takeoff. I leave a sigh of quasi relief as I notice the line for security isn't full of people standing idle, snaked around to oblivion. I take my place in line, fuming. I didn't even want to take this trip. I only left town to attend my uncle's funeral. It may sound cold, but I'm not even grieving. The man was a useless shit stain from the moment he was born to the moment he drove headfirst into a tree trunk, drunk off his ass. As I reach the front of the line, I rushed through the motions, setting my work laptop in its own separate bin, shoes, and belt removed. 
duffel bag dropped on the conveyor belt. Once I'm through, I practically sprint to collect my belongings. I almost put my shoes on the wrong feet. I'm so scattered. I check the gate on my boarding pass, then glance up at the overhead signage, groaning. Just my luck, opposite side of the building. With no time to spare, I duck and dart around packs of travelers, moving lethargically to their own boarding locations. I'm out of breath by the time I reach the gate, just at final boarding call. Shoving my boarding pass into the steward's hand, I busy myself with a voicemail. It's an angry tirade from my boss, of course, demanding I come into the office as soon as the plane's wheels hit the ground. Sir, are you, are you sure this is your destination? I hardly hear him over my boss's yowling. Frustrated, I grit my teeth. Yeah, 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 just let me on. Shrugging, he scans my pass. I juggle my luggage while drafting an email on my phone, finding the final available spot beside a rather ill-looking woman. Sign, I thrust my bag in the overhead space and plop into the seat. The plane takes off with no mention of safety protocols. Either that, or I'm too distracted to notice. I've just closed my eyes to settle in for a nap when the passenger beside me taps my shoulder. So, she chuckles nervously. You ready for the heat? Christ, I think. She's one of those people. I offer a curt response, hoping she'll take the hint. I've lived in Phoenix all my life, so... Well, I guess that certainly helped prepare you. Her response confuses me, unsettles me, but not enough to pry any further. I'm finally getting comfortable again when she interjects. What brings you to our, um, our destination? I'm on business. On business, she guffaws. <laughs> Must be a lawyer. I've heard there's plenty of those where we're going. I burrow my frow dig through my pocket for my boarding pass. There must be some mistake. She takes my silence as an opportunity to ramble on. I'm sorry, I'm not usually like this. I'm just anxious. I made my decisions, hurt a lot of people. She grimaces exaggeratedly before whispering, between you and me, I killed my husband, stuffed the pieces in his mistress's suitcase. The woman raises the sleeve of her shirt to reveal two gaping slashes running vertically up her arm, still oozing dark blood, recoiling, I glance frantically around the plane and its passengers. They're all pale, dark circles etched under their eyes. Some are old and frail, but some are young and shouldn't look so ghastly. One has a gruesome shotgun blast to his stomach, torn open into a seeping pit. I don't know where I am. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know who any of these people are. Don't know what they are at all. I tense, panicking, until my gaze lands on a familiar face just across the aisle. He's barely recognizable due to his injuries. Face bruised and swollen, nose crushed, limbs broken at odd angles. It's impossible, but I know that I know him. It's my uncle, the one whose casket was buried mere hours ago. He gives me a smile and a wave, teeth shattered, fingers crumpled. I look down at my boarding pass. In my haste, I've misread the gate number. This is, this is not my flight. The pilot's voice abruptly comes on the overhead speaker, eerily cheerful with patches of distortion. We've reached our destination, folks. Buckle up, it's a quick descent. Where, where are we going? The woman looks to me, confused, as the plane launches into a sudden nosedive. The comfort of gravity is ripped from beneath me all at once. She appears completely unfazed. Isn't it obvious? The temperature rapidly increases to a sweltering heat, windows fogging over and cracking in the blistering atmosphere. We're going down. Just shut the f up, Danny, shut the f up. That scream finally got through to him. The begging, threatening, explaining, and pleading would not stop my son from bouncing off the walls. Only the shouting was effective. Only the swearing worked. My six-year-old son looked up at me as the broken pieces of my Nikon P1000 camera lay scattered at his feet, frozen in place. A chill stabbed my gut as I realized that he was afraid of me. The chill sunk deeper when I realized that a small part of me was grateful for his fear. I wiped a tear from my face. I'm going outside, watch your brother. Daddy, I take care of your brother. I hissed while pulling on my shoes. I'll be right outside. I slammed the door because that's what people do when words run out before anger does. I knew that leaving a six-year-old boy in charge of a three-year-old boy is a stupid thing to do. But Arthur Park is a half a block from our apartment and I needed to remove myself before I lost control entirely. I collapsed on a bench and heaved. The sun was shining, kids were laughing, and I wanted to smack them for being happy. I closed my eyes and faced the sky. You look like shit. I didn't know who was speaking, but it didn't matter. You try raising two out of control boys after their mother dies and get back to me on whether you care about looking like shit. I 
felt him sit next to me. I opened my eyes. He wore a gray trench coat despite the heat, looking like he was either getting ready to sell me a stolen wristwatch or expose himself. Do you love them? I stared at the man. He was old, at least 80. He didn't wear it well. His ice blue eyes sunk deep into sallow rice paper skin. Of course I love my kids, I shook my head. This wasn't how it was supposed to go. Amanda was the best woman on earth. Not the hottest, not the richest, just the best. I never doubted fatherhood because I never doubted her. I forcibly controlled my breathing. One thing goes wrong and suddenly there's a lifetime to deal with the consequences. I nodded. I love them, which is why it scares the sh out of me when I have thoughts of, I froze. He waited expectantly. I shook my head again. I've always thought of myself as a good man. I never understood the pieces of shit poop. I pulled my hair. For five hours this morning, five hours, Danny would not stop. He hit his brother, he hit me, he screamed at us both, and he broke a $1,913 camera that was one of the only joys I had left in my life. As pathetic as that sounds, my breath hitched. That's why I can't even own anything made of glass. I finally snapped. I screamed at him, swore too and only scaring my son finally got through to him. When it happened, I thought this made sense. I chuckled, <laughs> and now here I am, the biggest piece of shit on earth, unloading my life story to a stranger in the park since I'm less of a danger to my children when I'm away from them. I looked back up at the sky. Enough about me. What part of your world did you stop believing in today? He pulled a gadget from inside his coat. It looked like a small remote control with just two buttons on it. The man extended his hand to me, making creepy eye contact as he waited for my reaction. The top one's for Danny, the bottom is for Kevin. I wanted to puke as the weight of it fell into my hands, my eyes drawn down toward it. How did you know their name? I looked up, he was gone. The slow creep of panic flowed into the far corners of my body as I hurried home. How could I have left my kids alone? Would they be taken away from me if one had gotten hurt? I was sprinting by the time I reached my apartment door and wasted no time in flinging it open to find Danny and Kevin were sitting quietly on the living room floor, picking up the pieces of my broken camera. I shut the door behind me as a witch's brew of emotion flooded through my head. Relief battled with the nagging thought that my children only calmed down when I was gone. I wondered if my boys would be happier with someone else, and the thought nearly tore me apart from the inside. I'm sorry I broke your camera, Daddy, and I'm going to... Danny's voice was cut off by Kevin screaming loud enough to peel the paint from my walls. I covered my ears and looked down to see him lying on the floor, kicking his legs into the air. A broken shard of camera plastic lay near his bare foot. I had left a stabbing hazard in my home for my children to walk across. I clenched my fists in frustration while pressing my hands close against my ears, accidentally squeezing the remote control in the process. Sudden silence. I stared at Kevin in confusion. His eyes rolled wildly around while his trembling lips struggled to scream, but he couldn't make a sound. His lips just looked slightly bluish. That's when I realized that his chest wasn't moving. Kevin! I dove to the ground, trying to pull the ancient CPR training from the depths of a reeling mind. It's hard to think straight when your world will end if you can't think straight. I lifted my son's paralyzed body, and then he screamed. He gasped desperately for deprived air, and the noise that attacked my eardrums might have been the most wonderful I've ever heard. I hugged him tight and slipped the remote into my pocket for safekeeping. Both Kevin and Danny became quiet for 15 uninterrupted minutes afterwards. I used the sudden reprieve to race through some financial paperwork, since I didn't know when my next opportunity would be. That's how I found the $1,000. I assumed that it had to be a mistake until I read the memo that appears next to every transaction on the website. Payment for one press of the button. It didn't make sense, but nothing that happened in the past hour seemed real. How did he know that I'd press the button? Moreover, how the actual f did a remote control cut off a person's air supply for 20 seconds? And why would anyone pay me to choke my son? When I first held Danny in my hands, it was the realest, surreal moment of my life. Amanda and I had created a tiny human that was completely dependent on us for every aspect of his existence. In one short moment, he had completely taken my breath away. I didn't know how it was possible, but I accepted it just the same. I held it together through the tantrum that Danny threw after hearing that it was bedtime. But after he finally passed out, I collapsed on my own bed and cried. I grabbed a picture of me and Amanda that I keep on my nightstand. It's face down most of the time because it hurts too much to see her smile. But I hug it in my weakest moments. I'm sorry, babe, I whispered. I want to be the best dad possible. 
but most days I have to settle for least awful. I slipped the remote control into the nightstand's drawer and tried fruitlessly to get some sleep. Breakfast was blissfully quiet. Danny helped Kevin to pour a second bowl of Cheerios. They said, thank you, and you're welcome. I love them more than anything on earth. Kevin reached to hug Danny and bumped his older brother's Nintendo Switch onto the ground. It cracked. Danny screamed. Then he leapt to his feet to get better leverage and punched Kevin in the arm. Kevin shrieked loud enough to send physical pain bouncing between my ears. Our entire morning collapsed in four seconds. I had to pry Danny away from his brother and carry him to his room, kicking and screaming. But as soon as I released him, he sprinted back to the kitchen. I chased after him to see Danny pick up his destroyed switch and sob. That was the first time I saw Kevin punch anyone. He slugged Danny in the shoulder, clearly still angry about being hit. He'd learned from his brother. I froze, simply because I was completely unable to conceptualize my next move. My world was filled with noise and nothing else. Then Danny tackled Kevin. I felt like the worst father on earth. There simply wasn't any possible way to express my anger sufficiently, but I somehow had to swallow it all and police their fight. On top of everything, I had to teach them a lesson powerful enough to stop this from happening again. My finger slipped into the pocket of my bathrobe. I don't remember deciding to push the buttons, but I clearly did so with enough intent to hit both simultaneously. Danny and Kevin let go of each other and grabbed their throats as heavenly silence descended upon the kitchen. I waited. Then I dove to the ground and held them both close, rocking back and forth as they gasped for air that wouldn't come. Kevin's face was screwed up in an inconsolable sob. Danny just looked at me in total confusion, wanting so badly to ask why this was happening to him. It felt like things were taking too long. I panicked, then both boys gasped at the same time, taking in huge breaths of air before hugging me tight as I cradled my sons on the kitchen floor. They forgot about the fight, and that very morning, their college fund was $2,000 richer. Life is a series of hard choices in which the beneficiaries never understand what sacrifices were made for their greater good. I didn't use it excessively, but whenever I got too lax with the remote control, they would start hitting each other once more. I was sleeping soundly again. I barely noticed when Kevin walked into my room that night. Back to bed, I mumbled. Read Dragons Love Tacos? He asked. No, Kev, bed, now. I forced myself up and carried him to his room tucking him in while half asleep. I locked my bedroom door behind me, which I rarely do, but I didn't want him wandering into my room all night. It was a good call on my part, because the next thing I remembered was waking up to a sunbeam crawling across my face. I stood, stretched, wiped my eyes, and headed toward the kitchen. The living room was a horrific mess. Every couch cushion was shredded. Every soft item had been pulled apart in ransacking that must have taken hours. I marveled at the fact that I didn't hear this taking place, but realized that it made sense given that I didn't own anything glass or breakable. Had someone tried to enter my room? My blood chilled as I turned around to see deep scratches dug into my bedroom door. I raced toward the boys' room. That's where I saw the vomit. Someone had emptied a day's worth of food. Gelatinous, bile blobs coated the floor and walls. Puddles of puke were connected by long, phlegmy strands of foul-smelling human spit. Farther down the hall, the vomit turned to blood. The victim had apparently run out of food before the puking was done. I sprinted, bare feet splashing in the disgusting fluids as I hurled into the boys' room. I opened the door and my world ended. Danny was dead. No amount of CPR would save a child with lips that blue. The room felt like it was swirling, like a toilet spinning into oblivion, like everything needed to be washed away. My legs were paralyzed, but my head could move just enough to take in the scene. Danny was coated in puke and blood, both of which were drying on his lips. Oh, God, had all the blood been his? I jerked my head looking for Kevin, and then everything made perfect, awful sense. Kevin held the remote in his hand. He must have grabbed it after coming into my room the night before, just before I locked the bedroom door to keep my children outside. Neither one of them would have understood that Kevin's tiny finger on the remote was causing Danny to lose air. He must have been in so much pain when he clawed the deep scratches into my door, unable to comprehend why I'd locked him out. He would have tried so hard to scream. Tearing apart the living room had been the only way to express his anguish as he slowly, slowly died. I don't know how many times Kevin pushed the button to make him vomit blood, but I had an extra $600,000 in my bank account that day. There's never a good reason for a 3.30 a.m. phone call. I was half asleep and half panicked while I fumbled around the nightstand in search of my phone. Hands shaking, I looked at the screen. No name, just a phone number ending in 1913. 
An unknown person was calling my phone at 3.30 a.m. No. I breathed as I answered. Jacob Adamson? No. I mean, yes, but no. Don't tell me. I'm calling from the Los Angeles Police Department. No. I was hyperventilating. I knew I didn't have the strength to hear what he was leading toward, but I was powerless to hang up the phone. I'm afraid I have some bad news about an accident. No! I shouted. No, you just... You don't tell me that. Just don't say anything. Just stop talking. My heart thudded in my chest. Udy Adamson is your son. Udy's my boy. I whispered. Please take this back. Please. His car lost control on PCH. No, 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 no. You take it back. You take it all back. I'm so sorry, Mr. Adamson. Udy died at the scene. Stop. I whispered. Movies cut scenes immediately after bad news has been dropped because the ensuing agony would be too much to watch. Five minutes of thinking about my dead son was a mental marathon. I fell to the floor, gasping, as I struggled to pull my socks on, only to give up and sob. I needed a break from the moment, just 10 seconds where I could forget about my dead son, just enough to catch my breath. But the pain was unrelenting. I knew that my mind couldn't endure it without cracking. I needed a break, I needed to breathe, but it didn't stop. The biggest trees pop and crack before they fall. I felt that happen inside my head. The cables that had once bound a stable world together snapped apart, turning and turning in the widening gyre. Everything spun out into nothing. What did I have left to look forward to? Life tells us that our children are the greatest accomplishment we can ever have. And now my boy was cooling to room temperature in a meat sack. You don't need to look at the body, the coroner said. The lights droned overhead in the sterile white room. The coroner glowed unnaturally. I have to see him, I breathed. I think you will regret this choice, he countered. I went in any way to look at what was left of my son. I regret that choice, I said on my way out. A few days later, I found myself wandering the streets of my town. I stumbled into an empty parking lot and contemplated life. A few moments later, I noticed a strange looking man appear. He continued to walk closer in my direction. What the f do you want, I asked. The man stood next to me. What makes you think I want something from you? I'm standing by myself in a barren parking lot, and you found some reason to do the same. People never behave oddly for the benefit of others. He smiled, and I finally looked at him. His trench coat was such a dark brown that I couldn't tell if it was dirty or clean. He was old, pushing 90, and looking like he'd been through hell. His sky blue eyes stood out against skin that hung like rotting peach flesh. Did your son love you? My head spun as my stomach flipped. Speaking with such a dry mouth took several attempts. If I still believed the world had any value in it, I would have punched your f***ing face in for asking that. He laughed without any hesitation. Then he touched my shoulder, and I wasn't in the parking lot anymore. In fact, I wasn't anywhere. I didn't recognize the disheveled living room, where a haggard-looking man was shouting at two children, clearly unaware of my phantom presence. Danny, don't f***ing touch Kevin. Then there was darkness. A man and a woman appeared next, but I still had no body. She was crying as he watched her in disgust. It doesn't have to be this way, Jasmine. If you're strong enough to put down that godforsaken bottle and apologize, we can move forward. The ball's in your court. She sobbed harder as he turned around and left. Then I was me again, just another person moving as fast as possible toward death. Hell is real, and it's on Earth, the Salaman explained. It's a curse that can only be granted by other people. The word should have chilled me, but I felt nothing. If what you're saying is true, then we're all the devil and we're all damned. I turned away from him. He rested a hand on my shoulder. You're right. So let me get this straight, I pressed. You think you can bring Yudi back? There is no think, the sallow man answered. Just a choice. But I have to send two people to hell? I continued. To earth. Yes, you understand me. I didn't like his smile. I gave you two visions that should not have been physically possible to witness. But you still doubt that the supernatural is natural. You are not among those who have not seen and yet have believed. I turned away. Then Yudi appeared before me, naked, trembling, and deeply afraid. He's real, Jacob. All people who ever lived are real. But you can only bring him back by choosing to send two others into hell. Their lives will become excruciatingly painful, yet they won't be able to let go and move on. 
Would you make two strangers indefinitely suffer the pain that you find unendurable? I stared at Yudi. He seemed afraid of me. Yes, I whispered. Let them suffer. I had no recollection of going home. We were simply standing in the living room, Yudi fully clothed, still staring at me in abject terror. I hugged him. It was like hugging an empty box. I pulled back and saw that he was crying. I brought you back from the accident, I whispered. My son looked up at me with bloodshot eyes. It wasn't an accident. It was on purpose, he responded. No, I gurgled. You had every reason to live. He punched the living room window in an explosion of glass and blood. You had every reason for me to live. Everything you ever said to me was designed to tear me down. His eyes and fist dripped freely. I, I only ever wanted what was best for you, I stammered. You only wanted what was best for you, he shot back. I shook my head slowly. No, it was, if I was ever harsh, it was only to bring out the best in you. He laughed and the sound chilled my spine. You could never bring out the best in me, dad, because it was impossible to succeed by your standards. I looked at myself through your eyes and I hated the person I saw. I sank to the floor. Yudi, I wanted to cry, but that part of my soul didn't work. Yudi, being without you was, Hell is a real place because that's where you left me. He stared back with bloodshot eyes. You'll have a lifetime to get used to it. He turned for the door. Don't follow me. Please stay where I put you. Hell is real, I said as the sallow man appeared next to me on the sidewalk. He smiled. This pain is worse than the first time I lost my son. I'm empty of everything. He didn't say a word. And the two others, I asked. The man and woman I saw, they're going through hell too? The sallow man clenched his fist. People bring hell, but they also bring redemption. Hell is a billion separate places designed to make people suffer alone. I nodded. I want to die, but the infinitesimal hope of Yudi returning keeps me alive in the most agonizing way. We stood in silence. I'd slit your throat, but that would just make things worse, wouldn't it? He expelled three heavy coughs, but Yudi, I asked, my voice low and careful. He lives? The sallow man eyed me close and nodded once. I let out a long, tense breath. Then it is enough. It happened as the bell rang, finally signaling a long-awaited recess. But as we got to our feet, another message played over the speaker system. Students of Recall Hall, please remain seated. The school has been put on lockdown. No one is allowed to leave under any circumstances. We all groaned in annoyance, hardly a soul taking the message seriously. Whatever drill we assumed the school was putting us through, none of us were having it. Only then did I glance outside to see three armored military vehicles approaching the school at high speeds. Within a minute, dozens of soldiers poured out with heavy equipment and metal plates running up to our windows. One by one, they started boarding them up, drilling the plates in front of our windows, making any thought of escape impossible. What's happening? Leo asked from the back of the class. The teacher didn't answer. He looked just as confused as the rest of us. He went to his desk and pulled out a phone, calling the principal, but he didn't answer. We're just going to stay here, all right? Let them deal with the situation, then we can leave. I dug my mobile phone out from my bag only to find that I didn't have any signal. While the school always had crappy service, had never been left without the possibility to call out. Whatever the soldiers had done, it had blocked off our only means of contacting the outside world. I can't call anyone, I said, holding up my phone. The other students, even Mr. Morgans, pulled out their phones, each of them with the same result. Everybody keep calm, it'll be all right, Mr. Morgan said unconvincingly. We just need to wait here for them to help his words were interrupted by frantic screaming coming from the hallway and heavy footsteps running just outside the door. We all sat in silence, listening intently to the commotion going on outside. Then, one by one, the screams were silenced, replaced by distant gurgles. By then, some of my classmates had started crying, while others sat frozen in fear. Fuck this shit, I'm leaving, one of the students said. It was Jack, the class asshat. 
He'd always been a daredevil, claiming nothing could scare him. But even for him, this was ridiculous beyond belief. He ran for the door, pulled it open, and started running down the hall. Mr. Morgans was too slow to stop him. He just rushed over to pull the door closed. We all sat back, ready for another bout of screams, but they never came. By all means, it seemed like Jack had made it to safety. But how he'd possibly leave the school, we didn't know. He made it? Leo called from the back. I don't know. It sounds like he's fine. Another one chimed in. As the news of his escape hit us, more of the students started feeling confident we could get out with him. Whatever the military had blocked the school for, it wasn't to keep us safe, so staying in one place might end up getting us all killed. While Mr. Morgans demanded we stay back, he couldn't fight us all, so a group consisting of four students, including myself, decided to leave. Leo took the lead, sticking his head outside the door and signaling that it was all clear. We ducked into the hallway in silence, making sure it was empty. The place was eerily quiet, a stark contrast to both its usual self and the screaming we'd heard moments earlier. We unanimously decided to head in the opposite direction of the sound, which also went towards the main exit. While we all figured the main exit was blocked, we were hoping one of the ventilation shafts had been forgotten, and the only vent entrance we knew about was situated near the main doors. If Jack had made it outside, that would be the only way. As we walked down the hall, the lights suddenly went out. It appeared that the electricity had been cut because even the ventilation system fell silent, meaning the whole building had lost power. The only light we had then came from our mobile phones, but it hardly provided any comfort. Then I slipped and hit my head on the ground. It hurt, and as I went to rub the back of my head, it felt wet. At first, I was worried I might have cracked my head open, but then I realized that my entire back was wet. Leo shined his flashlight at my back, immediately gasped as he realized I was covered in blood. The only issue was, it didn't belong to me. The entire hallway was covered in blood, the floor, the walls, and the ceiling. Maybe we should turn back? Lee said. No, we need to get out, Tyler argued back. We kept going, slowly moving forward in silence until we finally saw the exit. As suspected, the doors had been sealed shut by the same metal plates, but next to the door stood a ladder leading up to the vent, probably the one Jack had used to escape. Tyler rushed to the front and started ascending the ladder. As he got to the vent, he froze in place. Jack, he said quietly. He's in there? I asked, yeah, but he's not moving. Then Tyler started tugging on Jack's legs and tumbled back as he pulled half his body out of the vent, falling onto the ground and knocking himself out for a moment. Jack was dead, which meant that the monster had either climbed inside the vents or there were several of them. We, we should go back to the classroom and wait for help, Elise suggested as she stared at what was left of Jack. None of us could disagree, so we got Tyler back on his feet and started quietly walking back, praying not to garner the attention of whatever monstrosity had been unleashed within our school. When we finally got back, we found the door to our classroom broken and smashed to pieces. We stood frozen outside until I finally got the guts to check inside, holding the other back to protect them from what I knew was coming. The entire room was smeared with blood, with chunks of flesh lying on the floor. Every single person in the classroom had been killed, torn to shreds by an unknown entity. Had we not left to look for a way out, we'd all be dead too. Wh what are we going to do? Elise asked. I don't know. We just have to keep looking for a way out. We can't stay here. We turned to walk in the opposite direction, hoping to find shelter, or maybe even an escape through the basement. But as we turned to run, we heard a bizarre sound shatter the silence around us. What was that? Tyler asked with a shaky voice. It was the thing, it has to be. The darkness felt more overwhelming than ever, but we had to keep going. We ran through the halls, occasionally coming across streaks of blood. As we turned a corner, we heard Elise scream for her life. No, help me! She'd been snatched by a mangled appendage that wrapped itself around her leg. It stretched endlessly far into the darkness, belonging to a being that was too far away to see. 
We tried to grab onto her, but she was slipping away too fast. We could hear the bone within her leg get crushed to pieces as she slipped away from our grasp. Elise! Tyler yelled as he started to run after her. Leo tried to follow, but I pulled him back. Don't do it. We can't help her. Tyler! Leo yelled, hoping to bring him back to us. It was too late. He too got entangled in the many dark appendages, his body being crushed almost instantly under the pressure. They were dead, and there was nothing me and Leo could do about it. So we kept running, turning around corners blindly in an aimless attempt at escape. We'd gotten lost in the vast hallways of the school, and there were no obvious ways out. At least, we came to another set of doors that led out into freedom, but they were locked. Defeated, I just collapsed onto the ground, but Leah wasn't ready to give up. He kept hammering on the boarded up windows, and in the distance, we could hear the monster come closer. Within minutes, he'd be dead. Then, as he hammered for the last time, the metal panel suddenly vanished, letting light in for the first time. The doors blew open, and a team of heavily armed soldiers came running into the building. They threw something I could only describe as military-grade Molotovs before one of them turned to us. Is there anyone else left? No, no, they, they're all dead, I stuttered. With that, they pulled us out and sealed the doors back up. That was pretty much it. They loaded us into a vehicle and drove us to an isolated field hospital set up inside some warehouse. Once they'd confirmed we didn't carry any strange infections, we were put through a series of interviews. But nothing came of it, because the school was gone the next day, burned to the ground, and removed as if it never existed. And the hundreds of deaths were claimed to be caused by a crazy fire. All of it got brushed under the rug. But I can't hide the truth anymore. Even if they kill me, I need to get this story out. People deserve to know. The loudspeaker came on. We are on lockdown until further notice. Lock your doors. There is an imminent threat on the loose. I was in a classroom all by myself. I thought to myself, where is everyone? Where is the teacher? What danger could there possibly be? I got up from my desk and went over to the door. Looking through the glass panel in the door, I couldn't see anyone outside in the hallway. I opened the door and walked out into the hallway. It was dark and eerie looking. I looked left and looked right. In both directions, the hallway didn't seem to end. It went on for what seemed into an eternity and looked like a dark abyss. I decided to turn right and started walking forward. After walking about 10 feet, there was another hallway. It also seemed to go on for what seemed forever. Not wanting to change directions, I decided to keep proceeding forward on the same hallway. Every 10 feet, there were other hallways all intersecting the main hallway I was on. What the hell is this? I thought to myself. I saw a shadow quickly dart across the main hallway. I yelled, who are you? I ran to the spot it looked like he crossed over at. I turned left and decided to pursue whoever this was. The hallway was just like the others, seemingly going on forever never ending from what my eyes could see. After walking for about five minutes, I saw red glowing eyes that stood out from the darkness. I yelled, who are you and what is this place? I received no response from the man. As I continued my trek forward, the red eyes I saw faded into the darkness. After five minutes of walking, a classroom door appeared on the left side. I peered into the glass. There was a creepy guy at the front of the class dressed in a lab coat. I figured this had to be the teacher. All the desks were also filled with students. The students looked to be older though, probably in their mid to late twenties. They were also wearing similar medical outfits as the teacher. I knocked on the door. The teacher stopped his lecture, turned and looked at me. He had a shocked look on his face. Next thing I knew, he ran towards the door and locked it. I pleaded to him, let me in. How do I get out of this place? Please help me. He was expressionless, gazing into my eyes. I saw him back up from the door and reach for a telephone connected to the wall. 
I banged on the door some more. Nothing. No reaction. I kept moving, swiftly down the hallway. After what seemed like an hour of walking, another door appeared. This time it was on the right side of the corridor. I peered into the door. This time the room looked like a bounce house. A man in the middle was in a white straitjacket. As soon as he saw me, he ran towards the door. He screamed, help, help me get out of here. I tried to open the door. It was locked even from the outside. I yelled back, I will go and get help. We will get out of here. I continued my endless walk down the hallway. I thought to myself, what the hell kind of school is this? All of a sudden, a voice yelled out behind me. Hey, kid, come here. I turned around. In front of me was what looked to be a doctor. He was holding a syringe. I yelled out, who are you and what is this place? He replied, you are asking too many questions. Just stay there, I'm coming over to you. I ran in the other direction. Out of nowhere, another doctor sidelined. He pushed me to the ground. A syringe plunged into my shoulder. I awoke in a hospital bed, restrained. A doctor stood over me. He said, Frank, you forgot to take your morning meds again. Or did you forget to take them on purpose? I asked, where the hell am I? I was just in school and it was on lockdown. The school went on forever and I couldn't escape the building. He replied, school? On lockdown? That's a good one, Frank. I haven't heard that one before. You had the whole facility worried sick about you. I replied, you can't keep us trapped here forever. You are a sick man. He replied, I will let you out when you start taking your meds again. Other than that, I have to run to another patient. Oh, by the way, here is your pill. He placed it in my mouth for me and gave me water. I pretended to swallow the pill. As soon as the doctor left the room, I spit the water and pill out on the floor. After about 10 minutes, I closed my eyes and opened them. I was now sitting in the same empty classroom as before. The loudspeaker came on. We are on lockdown until further notice. Lock your doors. There is an imminent threat on the loose. I thought to myself, where is everyone? Where is the teacher? What danger could there possibly be? As we awoke to the horrified scream shattering the silence of night, it didn't take more than a second for my protective instincts to kick in. I grabbed my bat and ran upstairs to my children's bedroom. My wife followed behind me, ready to face any danger the world had to offer in order to keep our kids safe. Just at the top of the stairs, we immediately saw the smoke and heard the crackling fire coming from inside their room. And as I burst through the door, I could see the twin boys already turned to charred bits of flesh while our youngest daughter sat unfazed alone in her own bed. Defying all logic, the fire didn't seem to spread. It was locked to our son's burning bodies. They were dead before we even opened the doors. Even in the chaos, instinct to save whatever I could prevailed. I rushed over to my daughter and got ready to grab her and run. No sooner had my hands touched her before I felt a searing pain in my palms. Despite seeming perfectly fine, her body had turned to an uncontrollable source of heat. Joanna! I managed to get out as I stared at my burned hands. Then the fire suddenly cleared, leaving two charred bodies in a smoke-filled room. Joanna lifted her head and stared into my eyes. Her pupils had turned unnaturally large, occupying the entirety of her eyes. Mary sat hunched over by her sons, screaming at the loss of our twins. But I couldn't do the same. I was broken from shock. I couldn't take my eyes off Joanna. Despite the idea going against all logic, I knew she had been the one to kill her brothers, but I couldn't fathom why or how. Did you do this? I asked in a merely shaky whisper. But instead of giving an answer, she just smiled in return. She reached out her hand, her palms glowing with fire, and I took a few steps back in fear. Whatever creature was sitting in that bed might have looked like our daughter, but it wasn't her. In our part of the world, there wasn't a major hospital near every village. When things like this happened, the local doctor was called, if only to confirm the deaths before the bodies were taken away. In our case, he also came to check up on our daughter. We tried to warn him not to touch her, but suspecting foul play or abuse on our end, he insisted on talking with her alone. The police stood idly by outside, ready to interfere if need be. All the while, Joanna remained in her bed, not moving an inch. The doctor closed the door to get some privacy. I knew it would be a terrible idea, but what could I say against the police and the doctor who thought we were the culprits? Hello, Joanna. My name is Dr. Woodrow. 
I'd like to ask you a few questions, if that's all right. We heard the doctor say through the door. But as before, Joanna wouldn't respond. It's okay if you're afraid, Joanna. But I'm here to... Oh, God! His words quickly turned to agonized screams as the same blazing fire took over. With clear trepidation lighting up in their eyes, the police officers tried to open the door, but it had gotten inexplicably locked. They tried breaking it down, but by the time they could even get a proper kick in, the doctor had burned to death. The officers went to grab Joanna, much to my protest. No sooner had they touched her, before they too ignited in a hellish blaze that charred their skin and broke their bones. In the span of a day, five people had been killed by our daughter. But the thing about living in an obscure, small village is that no large news outlets are going to run with a story they believe is a myth. Over the next few days and weeks, several people contacted us with advice on how to deal with the situation, all locals. And throughout it all, one idea stood above all others, that our daughter had been possessed by some sort of entity. We weren't given any time to grieve the loss of our sons because we had to stay focused. We had to save the only bit of family we had left. Three weeks after the deaths, Joanna still hadn't left her room. She didn't eat, drink, or sleep. She just sat in bed and observed us whenever we entered. For each passing day, she got thinner, almost hollowed out. Whatever had taken over her was consuming her essence. And that's how we came to meet a man simply known as the pastor, an obscure priest seemingly experienced in the art of exorcism. Unlike the rest of the people we talked to, he didn't seem uncertain nor afraid. He met us at our home, entering without saying a single word. He took a few steps inside, looked around the room before a frown formed on his face. She's already dead, he said without even seeing her. No, she's not, she's up there. She's just not herself, my wife said. Her body might still be alive, but her spirit is too far gone. There has to be something you can do, please, we're begging you, I said. This demon's oral signature is unknown to me. It's strong and it's directly feeding off your daughter's soul. Even if I banish it from her body, your daughter, who she used to be, is long gone. The fact that her physical form is still kept together is a wonder in itself. But you'll try? He saw the look of desperation on her faces and knowing the story about our sons might have given him the final push of empathy needed to help us. He nodded. Tonight then, just past midnight, we need it dark. Cover up the windows, turn off the electricity, and bring candles or lanterns as sources of light. I'll take care of the rest. With that, he just left. I looked at my wife with a glimmer of hope, but the thought of our burning boys had tainted the love we had for our daughter. Logically, we realized that it wasn't her fault, but the image had been burned into our minds. That day, we just sat on our front porch with our eyes fixed on the road, just waiting for the pastor to come back. We didn't eat, drink, nor did we speak a single word to each other. We just sat idly by and waited. All the while, our daughter was trapped inside her own body, held at bay by a demon. A cool, uncomfortable wind dragged through the neighborhood as the last rays of sunshine gave way to the darkness of night. For each passing second, the clock ticked closer to midnight. We held our breaths in anticipation. When the street suddenly lit up, it was a car driving up to our house, a pitch black Ford Cortina, probably older than myself. The pastor stepped out in his gown, holding on a book with an upside down, burning cross displayed on the front. In any other case, I'd ask you to leave, he began. But unless she hears your voices, there won't be anything to bring her back. You can help me. We nodded without hesitation. There was no power in the world strong enough to stop us. Shall we begin? He asked. We followed him upstairs to our children's room. The walls were covered in a black, tar-like substance that seemed to emit from our daughter. She was barely recognizable as a human being, just skin barely attached to their bones. She silently observed us with that same horrific smile, one that only slightly faded when she saw the book the pastor was holding. Without giving her a chance to move, the pastor opened it and started speaking. The words that emitted from his mouth were from a language none of us had ever heard before. At first, it sounded like something akin to Latin, but it was twisted, dark, and full of malice. What is he saying? My wife asked. I don't know, was all I could stutter back. The words seemed to physically hurt Joanna. Her screams were mere hisses at first, but they quickly turned to low-pitched growls. Her body writhed around in pain as she tried to escape, but the words froze her in place. She couldn't leave. She could only listen as the words penetrated her soul and attacked the demon within. You're hurting her! My wife yelled as she tried to approach the pastor, but I held her back. Just as I grabbed her, the whole room fell silent. The pastor shut his book with a resounding bang, and that was it. Joanna fell limp on the bed. 
I thought it was over. But then pillars of black goo shot out from her mouth along with a smoke-like figure. Then another, and another. Dozens of creatures escaped our daughter's body and phased through the wall like it was nothing. They were out of sight before we could even react. But in their wake, our daughter looked almost human again. I rushed to grab her, cradling her in my arms, just hoping to feel a hint of life still within. She coughed a couple of times, then her chest started to move with her breaths. Oh, thank God, I let out in relief. But then I noticed the horrified look on the pastor's face. What, what have I done? He asked himself. What's wrong? There shouldn't have been more than one. It's not possible, he mumbled. Flashes of the multiple creatures pouring out from Joanna stuck in my mind as I realized that our daughter had never been possessed by just a single demon, but countless horrific monsters that had now been released into our town. This will be the end of us, the pastor mumbled. In the following days, we saw less and less people on the streets. Rumors of entire families dying spread like wildfire, too fast for any real help to reach our little, isolated town. Whatever had been trapped within our daughter was quickly taking more vessels and were seemingly using humans as portals to bring more demons to our world. Our daughter was indeed special, her body the perfect breeding ground for demons from a dimension we weren't meant to comprehend. And through her, they learned to do the same to others. Had we just let her die from the inside, the demons would have remained in the underworld where they belong. But our love, our need to save her, has doomed the entire town, maybe even the world. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened that night or what she was planning to do with me. I am just glad I made it out alive. It all started when my friends and I decided to go to Vegas for my 21st birthday. At the last minute, everyone bailed besides my good friend Dylan. We got to Vegas and checked into a fancy hotel on the Vegas Strip. It was $400 a night, so I was glad we were only staying for three nights. After checking in, a brunette girl came over to Dylan and I. She was drop dead gorgeous. She had a thick Russian accent. I always had a thing for accents. She had on tight jeans and a shirt that matched the colors of the hotel. She asked us if we needed help bringing our luggage to our room. I quickly said yes before Dylan could even mutter a word. I asked for her name and she said it was Alexandria. I thought, wow, a hot name too. As we made our way up to the room, I made small talk with her. We got to our room and Alexandria just stood there awkwardly. I completely forgot bell girls work for tips. I quickly pulled out my wallet and gave her a 20. She smiled and winked at me. But before I could even say another word, she turned her back and walked down the hall. Dylan said to me, if you keep tipping like that, you'll be out of money the first night. I said, I know man, but she was just so hot. The first night, Dylan and I bar hopped on the Vegas Strip. I don't even remember getting back to the hotel. My next morning was met with a hangover from hell. Every time I moved, I would feel a pounding in my head. Somehow, Dylan was completely fine. He didn't even feel hungover at all and wanted to go out and party more. He told me there was a pool party nearby. I told Dylan that he should go by himself because I wanted to get some rest. I woke up a few hours later to Dylan coming back to the room soaking wet. He told me to get ready to go out he said he met some cool guys and girls who were having a pregame in another room. My head still felt like a bomb went off inside. I told him to go out and that I may join him later. Dylan left without protesting. I went to sleep and woke up two hours later. It was 8 p.m. I felt much better and decided to go to the hotel bar. I figured a drink or two would get me back to feeling normal. I sat down at the bar and ordered a drink. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Alexandria. She was wearing tight leather pants and a red shirt. She looked stunning. I noticed she was coming towards me. I thought there was no way she even remembered me. She sat down right next to me and ordered a drink. My heart started racing in excitement. She nudged me on the shoulder and said, hey, we hit it off right away. I learned that she came from Russia on a work visa and sent most of her money back home to her family. As we talked back and forth, she started to gently touch me. It was subtle, but I got the message that she liked me. I started to touch her back, and then we started making out. After making out at the bar for a while, I thought a more private setting would be more appropriate. I told Alexandria I was going to use the restroom, and then after we could go back to my room. She happily agreed. I returned from the restroom and closed out my tab. As I left the bar, Alexandria nudged me 
She said, you're not going to finish your drink? I didn't even notice I still had anything in my drink. I quickly picked up my glass and downed it. Alexandria <laughs> chuckled. It wasn't a friendly laugh. It had an evil undertone to it. I instantly got a bad feeling from her. She yanked on my arm and said, let's go back to your room, silly. As we got close to the elevator, my vision started to fade. My legs started feeling like putty. I heard someone ask in the background, is he okay? I tried to cry for help, but nothing came out. Alexandria answered, he's fine, just had too much to drink. The elevator door shut, and that's the last thing I remember. I woke up in my hotel bed. My hands and feet were tied to the bedposts. Alexandria was standing in front of the bed. She was dressed in a white coat, almost like a surgeon. I noticed there were all kinds of medical tools on the nightstand. I heard her say, he's not supposed to be awake yet. I started screaming. Alexandria quickly gathered her things and left. An hour later, Dylan helped untie me. He had a big smile across his face. He asked, what kind of kinky stuff did you guys do? I told him everything that happened and he was shocked. I went to take a shower to get ready for bed. I opened the bathroom door and was horrified to what I found. The bathtub was filled to the brim with ice. There was a cooler next to the toilet filled with ice also. I didn't know what to think. Was Alexandria a crazed killer? Was she trying to harvest my organs? All I know for sure is that I'm not going to Vegas anytime soon. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video. You can also check out some more of my animated horror stories right here.